you can't fuck up this life. Like that saying is like, like anchored in. It's like no matter what you do, and that's the thing with risk. It's like, should I do it, should I not do it? What's the right thing to do? What's the right thing to do? It doesn't matter. It's like either you take the risk and from whatever label you place upon it, it goes well. But even if it doesn't, and that's the lesson here, it's like you'll still learn from it. It's, the, it's what you needed. No matter what you do, no matter what you choose, it's the right choice. Even if it goes down, it's leading you back to where you should go anyway. There is no fucking up. And just accepting that, like, just <sighs> takes away so much pressure. Like, we all have that universal question, am I doing it right? Yeah, you are. No matter what you do, you'll do it right. And just gone. And that's really the state I'm in now. It's like, even sitting here, extremely at ease, extremely relaxed. There's zero, again, like impurity. There's zero, okay, what's that? What am I going to say next? Oh my God, am I cueing the content correctly? Oh my God, what are people thinking? Oh, is this is recording the video? Oh, what are people going to think of the video? Oh my God, am I, oh, am I tired? Oh, what? It's all is good. For you to actually live life, for you to actually experience life, it has to be coming from a place of abundance and happiness. It can't be coming from scarcity and unhappiness. Because if it is scarcity and unhappiness, you're not actually living or experiencing whatever you know, you're doing. You're simply escaping what you think your default is. Okay, so let's just take a purpose. You hear that, hey, to feel happy, to feel complete, you need a purpose in life. I'm like, oh shit, I need a purpose, what's my purpose? So you start thinking about it, what's my passion, what's my purpose? And uh, you know, we always tend to think a purpose is something very artistic. So you're like, oh, maybe it's fucking music. Let's just take music as an example. That's my purpose in life. Now what do you think, for me to be happy, I always have to be on my fucking purpose. I always have to be doing that. You know, now in a way, it's not really happiness because it depends on something. And that purpose, you're not actually doing it because you're inspired to do it. You're doing it to escape that default that you think is unhappiness. So it's an escape. Just think of it too, like when you get home after work, like how soon till you jump on the computer or turn on your cell phone? How much time do you spend alone with yourself? Probably very fucking little. You know, as soon as you're alone, you're like, oh shit, I'm gonna fall back to ground zero, oh shit, those negative emotions, the shame, all that shit, and try to distract yourself, you escape. So in a way, we're all living a life of escapism. Everything you do is escape. And until you address that original assumption that's wrong, that you know, our default is unhappiness, you won't really live life, you won't really know what having a purpose is like. Like all those things you hear, to have a purpose, you will be happy, to be, um, giving, you'll be happy. If you're grateful, you're happy. For those to work, they have to be coming from the right original assumption. This is something you should all do. Like sit down and be like, why do I want this? Why do I want the girlfriend? Why do I want the money? Why do I want success? Why do I want to hustle? Why do I want to have a purpose? Why do I want friends? It's always to be happy. I want the fucking beautiful girlfriend so all my friends can see me with the beautiful girlfriend and uh, they'll finally approve of me and this means I can finally approve of myself. If a girl who's that beautiful and accepted by societal you know, standards is with me, this means I have value, this means I'm lovable and I can love myself. Um, if I sleep with 100 girls, it's the same thing. If 100 girls like me, what does that mean about me? I'm pretty damn fucking cool and there's no reason to hate myself and I can finally love myself and I can finally be happy. I want money to be happy, I want success to be happy. Um, literally everything you do, I want good grades, I want to be good, I want a good job, I want a wife, I want to get married, I want kids, um, whatever it is, if you follow the trail of wise, it's always to be happy, okay? This is the ultimate goal, um, this is what drives us 24-7, like this is it. This is the only drive that we have, it's to be happy. Whatever it is, think about it now, whatever, even little small goals, whatever it is, it's to be happy. Most common answer, like what makes you happy? Going to a movie watching a cool TV show, uh, eating food, um, sex, masturbation, drugs, drinks, smoking. It's an escape. And you're like, that's when I'm happy. But it's not true happiness. Why? Because it's temporary and you don't fix the cause. The underlying problem is still there, the fact that you assume that unhappiness is your default. Okay? And these are some obvious ones, like smoking, drugs, so on and so forth. But it could also be simple things like drinking kombucha or drinking a green juice. I feel happy when I drink this really healthy um, juice. That's cool, but what happens when it ends? What happens when you finish the fucking drink? 
When happiness depends on something, it's always temporary. I'm only happy when I meditate. What happens when you don't meditate? You go back to being unhappy. I'm only happy when I have a purpose in life. I heard that. When I have a purpose, you're happy. When you have a passion, you're happy. What happens when you don't have a purpose? What happens when, you know, it's like, what, have, what if you don't have a purpose? You fall back into unhappiness. I'm only happy when I'm grateful. Gratitude is happiness. When I wake up, I make a list of everything I'm grateful for, and I'm happy. What happens when you're not making that list? You go back to unhappiness. I'm only happy when I'm forgiving. You know, when I forgive people, I'm happy. What if you're not forgiving? What happens when you're done forgiving? You go back to unhappiness. It's literally like we're putting our fucking hand like in the flames, like in the fire, and we're like, let's put a little water. I'm happy until you're back in the fucking flames. It's crazy. It's, that's what we call happiness. And it's not really happiness, because again, you know deep down inside that the underlying co like, problem's still there, and you know it's temporary, so there's that worry. How long is it going to last? How long is happiness going to last? If you're happy now, you might have been looking forward to this event. You're like, fuck, when I'm at this event, I'm going to be happy. When I'm in Vegas, I'm going to be happy. What, what happens when you're done with Vegas? This entire time here, there's probably that little lingering fear of, what happens when this ends? How long is this going to last? What about the next thing? And most of the time, you're probably worrying about the next thing. Like, what do I do next? I don't want to fall back to my default. What do I do next? We know that we're not going to find happiness based on all those things. Like right now, if I gave you literally everything in the world, like let's just say you had everything of the world, you were the god of the world, would you be happy? If the answer is no, why do you keep fucking seeking it? <laughs> and all these things and all these validation and all these people and all these objects and all these green juices and drinks and all this knowledge and all these relationships. If you literally had everything in the world, you'd still not be happy. It's pretty crazy. Because again, it's still within that paradigm. What you're seeking is in another paradigm. A good quote to kind of uh, hammer this home is, we're trying to seek the infinite with the finite. We're in this world of like limited things and we're seeking the unlimited. It doesn't matter how much limited things you get, you're never gonna get the unlimited. You know, I forgot where I heard this. It's like trying to count till infinity. Can you count till infinity? Yes or no? No, there'll always be another fucking number. Doesn't matter how many, like how high you get, you're never going to reach infinity. And that's what we're all seeking. It's like we're seeking like infinity. We're seeking that state of happiness in the finite. Depending on what paradigm you're in, it's going to influence every single thing that you do. It's going to influence the way that you live your life. Everything. Okay. Now, to find out what it is, just think: what is your default? Right now, if you just did nothing, what would you fall to? And just by the way that we're conditioned, we all think we fall to this. It's pretty crazy. If we don't hustle, for example, if we don't make money, if we don't work on ourselves to improve, um, if we're not successful, if we don't get a good job, if we're not interesting, we fall to shit. That's literally what we think. Like right now, if I told you, like, don't hustle, you'd be like, I, mu I must hustle, or else. Or else I fall to this. So in a way, our basic assumption, this is again the way that we're conditioned, everyone's like this, we assume that that is our default. And that's the shit that's driving us, and from that basic assumption of unhappiness and scarcity, so on and so forth, all of our attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, actions grow. Okay? And what we try to do, and this is what's interesting, is we assume that that's our default, and then we're all seeking this. We're all seeking happiness, abundance, complete, enough, self, authentic, but assuming that our defaults on happiness, scarcity, so on and so forth. And this is why it never fucking works. Conscious is any everything you're aware of right now. Subconscious is everything you're not aware of. Simple as that. Right now, you're aware of me talking, you're aware of you're in the room, et cetera, et cetera. If I ask you, what did you eat for lunch yesterday? Now you're aware of it, but it was in your subconscious. If you're aware of everything, your brain would explode. If you were aware right now consciously of your breaths, of your body temperature, of your heart rate, et cetera, et cetera, you would not function in this world. So you have things like memories, things that are automatic, autopilot, habits, so on and so forth, as well as all the shit you hate about yourself and you don't like about yourself. Like the trash can of your mind, if you will. And in there, there's all the stuff you think is bad about you. Okay, so for example, 
say, let's just link it to girls. Say you're out, you're as a kid and fucking like you're five years old and uh, say you like a girl. Okay, and I remember like probably everyone can relate. I can relate. You like a girl. What happens if you're a kid and you like a girl and everyone finds out? They mock you. They make fun of you for liking a girl. You're shamed for liking a girl. And very fast, you're like, oh shit, I don't want to experience this. Let's hide this. And let's not let anyone ever know that I like a girl. No? Do you guys ever have that? Are you ever mocked for liking a girl? Yeah. Okay. All of us. So we're taught, like, oh shit, the part of me that likes a girl, let's put it down here. Let's put it out of sight. Let's disown it. This is not part of me. Let's never show anyone. This is our dirty little secret that we like girls. Another one is, say you're a little too loud as a kid. People are like, shut the fuck up. You're like, well, it's not okay for me to be loud. So you put loud down here. Um, if you state your opinion and you're actually real, that's, oh, not, nope, that's not good. Okay, well, let's not fully be real. I gotta hide this aspect of me. And you start developing again, like your ego. Um, if um, different emotions are, are, are bad, like say you get upset as a kid and your parents are like, don't get mad. Or as a guy, here's another one, don't be a pussy. You feel a little sad, don't be a pussy, man up. Oh shit, well I can never feel sad, I can never be afraid, um, I can never feel anxious, so on and so forth, and you just keep shoving it down there. Okay? Now, because of this, a few things happen. On one hand, this shit doesn't go away. It's still there, okay? It's still running. And uh, the longer it stays down there, okay, your mind's repetitive, the more of a charge there is behind it. You don't feel like you're enough because there's this shit here that you hate about yourself. And you never fully accept yourself. And you can't fully accept yourself until you also accept all this stuff here. It's like we always feel like there's a little part of us that's fucking wrong. There's a little part of us that's fucked up. There's a part of us that's not okay. Everyone else is totally fine. There's a part of us that's not okay. And you can tell yourself consciously, I'm enough. I am fully complete. I am perfect. Subconscious, which is 90%, bullshit. And the subconscious always wins. Okay? Um, different beliefs, too, for example. Like, what you think you deserve out of life, that's in your subconscious. Um, if, you, um, if you're a kid, like you take in a lot of like, information, like you look at the relationship, for example, your parents have, and you're probably like, ooh, that's my definition of love. That's my definition of what it means to be real. That's my definition of forgiveness, et cetera, et cetera. And then consciously, you're like, man, I really want a long-term relationship. I really want to find love. Subconsciously, love equals your parents getting divorced. And then you keep self-sabotaging. Here, there's your definition of who you are. In your subconscious, it's like, my identity is this. Consciously, if you want to change. Subconsciously, you keep getting pulled back to this shit. No? You want to lose weight? A little sprint? <whistles> pulled back to what you think you deserve. If you're someone who's like working on being confident, what are you constantly reinforcing that you're not confident to begin with? If you're someone who's working on self-improvement, what are you constantly reinforcing that you need to be improved? So it's endless. Okay? Now, this is what I call step one to personal development. And you're in this paradigm where you think this is your default. And uh, for anyone in that paradigm, what you should be focusing on is optimizing it. That's usually the step that we take. And that's where all this advice you hear, it's like, well, if you have social anxiety, um, go out and uh, start putting yourself out there. You know, start working on becoming more confident. If you're someone who's always negative, um, give yourself a positivity challenge. Focus on some positive things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, like working on becoming more confident, be, you know, improving yourself, et cetera, is good because it's optimizing this paradigm. But that's only step one. Step two is dropping that paradigm and moving towards the abundance paradigm. Okay, and it's asking yourself, well, why am I not motivated to, like let's just say you need to work on hustle, why are you not motivated to hustle in the first place? Why are you not confident by default? Okay, so it's changing that default. What if if you stop doing whatever you're doing, instead of falling, you realize you're there? And that's the second step. We buy into so many lies that cause us so much fucking suffering, it's insane, you know? Um, one is that things should remain permanent. That's what we try to do. We try to create this life that just, tries, just stays the same. And when shit crumbles, we're like, no! Instead of being like, hey, nothing's permanent. Nothing. Anything you want to hang on to is going to leave eventually. If you get someone's approval, guess what? They can also disapprove of you. You know? If you build something and it also like break, 
Like nothing's permanent. You should be aware of that by now. Now the plus side with the nothing's permanent is you could be freaking out like, oh my god, it's all going to crumble. But if you're also in that state of everything's crumbled, <laughs> that's not permanent either. <laughs> That'll go back up eventually. And you got to let go of that label of I must always chase everything going well all the time and embrace both sides of it. Embrace the contrast. You know, and that's really what, I mean, it's, it's not the thing you want to hear when you're going through shit, but that's what makes life worth fucking living. If everything was amazing all the time, it'd be so fucking boring, we'd all be depressed. We'd all be in the state of apathy and depression because it'd be like, ugh, like where's the fucking contrast? You know, if you look back at your entire life, it's those ups and downs that made life fucking awesome. Now at the time, it, could, it, it still sucks, but you need to feel that so you feel when it goes up again. I kid you not. It's like, that's what makes some fucking movie exciting. And that's ideally how you should want to create your life, like a fucking movie. Where if you look back at your life, is it a movie you'd want to watch? Is it a movie that's exciting? And what part of the movie are you living right now? Is it the slump? Is it that moment you're like, oh fuck, everything's going to shit, what's gonna happen to this guy? If there wasn't that moment, what a boring ass movie. You know? So it's embracing that. It's like, okay, chaos times. Let's fucking do it. Oh, success times. Let's fucking do it. Happiness times. Fuck yeah. Sadness times. Fuck yeah. Embrace it all. And remind yourself of that movie. And remind yourself, too, of previous moments you felt this where it didn't last. Whatever happens to you, there's a certain lesson to get out of it. And the lessons that life teaches you or nature teaches you or God teaches you, whatever you want to you know, believe in, uh, are not always aligned with your own personal agenda. There's what you want and there's what you need. And when shit hits the fan and there's adversity, usually you're getting what you need, but you don't know it yet. And that's really what a life crisis is. A life crisis is when something happens that doesn't go according to plan. We're all hooked on, this is my life, this is what I want, this is what I want to happen, this is the direction I want to go in. Boom, something happens that doesn't go hand in hand with that. <gasps> Chaos, adversity, oh my God because it's challenging what you want or what you're attached to. Versus, oh no, maybe there's a lesson here. And maybe this chaos and adversity is going to create an opening for something new. And that's usually what happens after a life crisis. So often you hear, I lost my job, yet I found a better one. No, and probably if you didn't have that crisis or if say you weren't fired, you would never have quit that fucking job. Yeah. <laughs> Same with the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, hell yeah, man. <laughs> um, no, it's true. It's like you never fucking quit. Or with a relationship. So often, a breakup, horrible, but yet you found someone better. You're like, shit, what was I doing there? So more often than not, it creates an opening for something new. You must accept who you are right now, all of it, and your life situation right now. Accept it and love it. Everything about you right now. As you're hearing this, you're probably cringing. You're like, oh, fuck no, look at my, my fucking body, how can I accept this shit? Look at my income, how can I accept this shit? Look at my life situation, look at my, my clothes, my life. I can't accept who I am right now. But until you do, it'll keep running you and you will never be free. Because everything you do will be in a reaction to that. Accepting who you are and everything that is you right now doesn't mean Settling, it doesn't mean stagnating, it doesn't mean hanging on to it. In reality, it's the only way to let go of it. If you don't accept who you are right now, you're hanging on to it big time. Huge. Think of people who get into a fight. Say you hate your parents, common. You get into a fight with your parents, you're like, fuck my parents, I'm gonna move. You might move across the country, across the world. You're away from your parents, you might not even talk to your parents in years. Physically, you're away from your parents. You've severed the link, correct? But have you? Because I've talked to people, clients of mine, 40, 50 years old, still being run by their parents. And it could be hate, like, oh, but my parents, but my parents. I bring it up, no, fuck my parents, I hate my parents. I'm doing this to prove them wrong, I'm doing this to show them. Okay, they're physically separated, but they're still a psychic link, if you will. They're still acting in reaction to their parents years later. They're not free. Same with who you are here right now. Until you accept everything that is you, you're still gonna be run by that. You'll never let go of it. You'll never transform. You'll never self-actualize. You'll keep hanging on to it. 
So in reality, you have to accept it to let go of it. Everything. Your personality, your life, your looks, everything. Anyone here going through adversity, going through something bad, how do you know it's bad? That question is huge. How do you know? And then reflect on how ignorant you are. You know, because what is really like a life crisis? It's when things don't go according to your plan. How do you know what's best for you? And really reflect on how little you know about the world, the universe, about like we know nothing. We're so stupid, so stupid. And really sit with that, like, holy shit, you're right, I'm so stupid. How the fuck do I know what's good for me or not? Oh, because I read it in a book, <laughs> you know? Well, how the fuck does that person know what's good for you or not? You have no idea, and we're so quick to judge shit. As soon as something's like, oh, it's not going according to plan, fuck, why is this happening? Stop judging it, how do you know? And then reflect back on all those things you thought were bad for you, and how maybe in the long run they weren't. You know, a common example, um, is, for example, like, why are you here? Probably a lot of you are here because you went through a shitty moment in life. Something happened to you, or you're just like, you know what, enough's enough, um, or something just made you feel like such a pathetic little bitch that you decided to step it up. For real. You know, if things were just going all, like, peachy your entire life, you wouldn't be here. Like, all of you are here because you went through a moment where it's like, enough's enough. You just felt so pissed off, disappointed in yourself, maybe hating yourself so much, you're like, you know what, fuck this shit. Let's do something about it. Now, you could think, why did that thing happen to me? Or why did I feel so sorry for myself? Why was my life sucking so much? But because of that, here you are on this whole new journey and new path in life. If I didn't have such a shitty, you know, childhood, growing up feeling like stifled, like shy, um, miserable, stuck, I wouldn't be here. You can think you know more than the universe, or the universe has your back. Now, fuck should I know if the universe has my back, but guess what? Life's a lot easier if you adopt that belief. You can choose to take on that belief or not. You can either resist it or go with the flow, and if you go with the flow, shit's way easier. I kid you not. So it's like, what works? I'm like, well, if I choose that the universe has my back, it's always easier. The cheesiest quote of all time, the universe has your back, okay? Um, but, Remind yourself of that. Say again, you have your plan. You're like, I want this, and I want this, and I'm building up to this, and I'm stored and gone. You can be like, no! Or maybe the universe did it for a reason. As I'm sure you know, human beings are creatures of habit. We're extremely attached to our comfort zone. We're extremely attached to our identity, to who we are. You think you want to change, bullshit. And I see it weekend in, weekend out on live programs. I see it on Skype coachings. I see it to pretty much everyone I talk to. When I give certain advice, they want some advice, but they want that advice to reinforce their current identity so they can feel better about being who they currently are. And it doesn't matter how much content is out there, they're going to filter what they look at through this in a way to remain in their comfort zone. All of us, deep down inside, we're running away from this ball of shit. You all have it, it motivates you to do everything you do. That's why you're here. You're asking, why don't I feel like I'm enough? Because you have this shit inside of you. You're constipated, filled with shit, dude. That's what's up. And instead of turning towards the shit and releasing the shit, shitting out, and this is, it might be another shit seminar with a lot of <laughs> shit words. Um, what we do is we just try to escape it. We try to ignore it. We do everything to just not face it. And the more we do so, the more dread there is around confronting this shit. And we hear, okay, be positive. The law of attraction. If you focus on positive things, you will attract positive things. And that reinforces, hey, don't bring your awareness into this shit. However, and this is big, whether you consciously focus on positive things or not, if unconsciously, in your subconscious, there's still that stuff going on, if you believe in the law of attraction, you will still manifest more of this. You can kid yourself as much as you want to think you're positive, Deep down inside, you got to release it. And you'll see it with people who are overly positive. There's something a little off in them. You see it especially in the self-help world. Hey, everyone. Hey, motivation 101, everyone. Yay. And it's like a little fucking fake. You kind of sense it. There's like some tension deep down inside. Anyone meet people like that? A little too hyper, a little too positive. You're like, that's not really real. You know, yeah, they might be, have some positive traits, but it's kind of overblown as a way to compensate for something else. 
And you might even bring it up like, hey, you know, I sense a little tension inside of you and immediately there's like massive defensiveness. Like, what the fuck are you talking about, you know? Like still trying to be positive, you sense it kind of stings them, okay? That is one example. So yes, if you focus on, say, positive things, you will attract more positive things, but to do so, you must bring your awareness to this shit and release it. And it's not pleasant. Instead of running away from it, you gotta dive into, like instead of, I'm not enough, what do I do? Why am I not enough? Why do I believe I'm not enough? And it's basically facing the shit you've been running away from your entire life. And it's not pleasant. It's like you got a fucking cut on your arm, and you're like, I don't have a cut, I don't have a cut, everyone. I don't have a cut. And you live in this state of denial. What you're doing here is acknowledge you have a cut. Bring it into your awareness, painful, in order for it to heal so you no longer run from that. Okay? And people use, for example, positive focus, positive thinking, the law of attraction to avoid that. Another one when it comes to, say, self-help or even spirituality is, uh, I'm not ready yet. You use it as an excuse to not take action. Hey, you know what? I'm not going to really do this thing yet because I haven't read enough books on it yet. You know, I'm not informed enough. Um, I'm not present enough. I'm not enlightened enough. And it's an excuse to avoid taking action. Or an excuse, and this one's big, to you know, not make money or be successful. And you'll see that. Just go on YouTube, I kid you not. Look up spiritual teachers. And you'll see these series of videos of people sitting in like, not to diss, to each their own, but let's just say a very shitty apartment and a shitty little camera, shitty little shot, shitty little clothes, shitty little everything. And they're just like, you know what? I, I just don't believe in this money stuff. I don't believe in success. I don't believe in money. That's materialistic things. Let go of materialistic things to transcend, right? And you just sense that, although, yeah, some people, you know, might not resonate with that, there's still that little bit of bitterness there. And what they're doing is they're using spirituality as an excuse to not take action, for example, or build, for example, their brand in order to affect more people, to reach more people. And that's an excuse that holds you back. Anyone who says, fuck making money, fuck taking action, fuck being successful, fuck that teacher. <laughs> However, they also have a point though. If you're only focused on making money, being successful, and you ignore the other side, then you become very bitter as well. So it goes both ways. One person could use, it's all about taking action, fuck the spiritual side to avoid it and avoid their growth. The other person could use, it's all about the spiritual side, fuck taking action, and they'll be blocked as well. It's a combination of the two. Okay, because trust me, if you just focus on taking action and money, what does your life look like? Pretty much the same as it is now, but a little bit more luxurious. Instead of wiping your ass with shitty toilet paper, you now have classy toilet paper. Instead of drowning your sorrows with shitty vodka, or whatever you drink here, I guess vodka maybe, yeah? you can drink more expensive vodka. But you're still living a life of waking up, eating, shitting, spending most of your day behind a screen. You might be able to afford a better screen, a better computer, a better cell phone, but life is the same. You just have more luxurious ways of distracting yourself or numbing your pain. That's it. But that's the same. And it gets really boring after a while. You wake up, you eat, you shop, you sleep. You wake up, you eat, you shop, you sleep. That's everyone's life. Wake up, eat, shop, sleep. Yeah, you can eat better stuff, shop more, but it's the same routine over and over and over again if you ignore the other side. Okay. So be careful not to use content or ideas to reinforce staying stuck in that state. Here's me becoming enlightened right now. Whoa. Do you feel that? Whoa. People. Oh my, I, can't, I can't put this into words. Oh my, it's happening now. I knew I, I was gonna joke. It's happening now, for real. Do you not feel, it's so beautiful. It's beyond words, everyone. It's beyond, it's, it's I'm the conductor. I'm the, <laughs> yeah, total, so dickish. This is what we think enlightenment is. I know, it's a, it's a very, trust me, I put this out in a video, everyone's like, he's enlightened. No. <laughs> Now, it depends what you label as enlightenment. Uh, people will have like those 
kind of like experiences of being in like a higher state where you're just like, holy shit. You know, I experience this at every Transformation Mastery live event, especially towards the end when people are sharing stuff. I am so fucking present. I'm in such a high, like just grateful state. It's insane. However, that's not the goal, okay? Enlightenment, and I call this like abundance, if you will, doesn't have an opposite. Enlightenment is a state of non-resistance, you might have heard this before, of non-duality where you just embrace and welcome everything. It can't have an opposite. If you think this is enlightenment and this is non-enlightenment, you're viewing it the wrong way. Because as soon as you're here, you're going to fear dropping back to this. So you can't fully feel at ease and at peace because there's resistance to not being enlightened. You can't be enlightened if you're resisting not being enlightened. Make sense? Enlightenment is a feeling of just being okay with everything. If you just embraced it all, you'd feel amazing. If someone told you, dude, feeling sad is the shit. In all the videos you've seen on YouTube up until this day, I've been telling you, feeling sad is the shit. You'd be happy. You're like, I'm sad. <gasps> Feeling angry is the shit, everyone. You get mad, you're like, fuck yeah. Your experience of it would change, right? That's enlightenment. It's not, I wanna be up here, I'm resisting being down here. It's, I'm okay with whatever's there. And then you just ride the roller coaster, the experience that is life welcoming it all. What fucks us is our resistance and our attachment. Again, this goes back to like Buddhism. No aversions, no attachments. We have that list of good emotions, happy, positive, etc., enthusiastic, and then there's a list of bad emotions, angry, etc. Now, all of these emotions are part of us. And they're going to happen, no matter what. You're human. And you should be afraid, get angry at times. That sends a lot of valuable data to your mind. If you're never afraid, you'd be dead. Yep. <laughs> okay? It, it makes sense to experience fear. The difference is, do you experience it? take the data and move on and just embrace what comes next and let go of it? Or do you hang on to it, perhaps by resisting it? I'm sure you've heard that saying, whatever you resist persists, and then it runs you. And instead of just being a temporary motion with data, it becomes a permanent state that you're stuck in, okay? So instead of trying to be this, by being attached to this side and resisting this side, I mean, swung back and forth, embrace it all, and that's enlightenment. The opposite is apathy where you resist it all. You're like, you know what? Fuck feeling happy. At least I won't feel sad. I just won't feel at all. You can't not commit. No matter what you do, you're committing to a path. You're either committing to a path of this thing, that thing, this thing, or you're committing to a path of nothing and stuckness. And there's a risk to all four options. If you do this, you might fuck up and you might have, you know, like, oh shit, I should have done that. That's true. There's a risk. But what's the risk of never committing? Remaining stuck and hating yourself and living a life of fucking regret. And that's a way bigger risk. I'd rather do something and then change courses and live like, again, like while you're doing it, you're loving it. And even if it changes, like it doesn't take away from those years. What sucks is I'm going to wait for this. And that is also the way we're conditioned. We're taught like, put your eggs in many baskets. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Keep all doors open. No, fuck that. Pick one. If it was the wrong door, walk out, go into the other door. But because we spread ourselves like that, I'm gonna do this, 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 we remain stuck. We dabble around. We never fully go all out. If your life was a movie, you'd have to rewatch on repeat for eternity, how would you live your life? So that when you rewatch it, it was just like, fuck yeah. Once you commit to it, you'll be surprised by how much will pop up just due to the fact that you've readjusted your RAS, okay? Like your selective focus, if you will. As soon as you're like, I'm doing this, no doubt about it, you're gonna start noticing shit that helps you go in that direction. If you've read the book, The Alchemist, which I highly recommend reading, um, there's a quote in it, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember specifically what it says, but it says something along the lines of, once you you know, commit to da, 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 your dream, the universe will conspire to help you or so, something like that. And it's so true. Once you commit, you'll start noticing opportunities. If you think you can't do it, it's not possible, you won't pick up on those opportunities. And you have to understand the power of selective focus. There's so much shit happening in the world. You can't pick up on everything at the same time. 
and you pick up on stuff that reinforces what you believe, what you feel. Commit to something else, you'll pick up and see the world a completely different way. You know? And you can do what you want. You can change your life. Right now, you don't have to go into work tomorrow. You can just drive off, move somewhere. You don't have to hang out with the people you hate. You can do what you want. You're fucking free. The limitations are in your fucking mind. You're a kid, you're thrown into this thing that is called life. You're like, what the fuck's going on? You learn two ways. First-hand experience and second-hand experience. First-hand is you do it. And you, you see for yourself. It's like, does it hurt if I touch the stove? <laughs> yes, learned. Okay, second-hand experience is someone telling you, hey, if you touch that, um, it's gonna hurt. So you learn both ways. In terms of secondhand experience, the way you're going to filter what you believe in or not is you're gonna look at how much authority the person has, how congruent they are, and how certain they are. So if someone tells you, if you touch that fucking stove, it's gonna hurt, and you see like they're very certain, they're very congruent in the way they say it, and let's just say a thousand people agree with them, you'll be much more likely to also believe that is true. Versus someone by themselves like, um, I think if you touch the stove, it, it'll burn? It'll hurt. Less likely, okay? And you get a lot of these, you could call core assumptions or original assumptions when you're younger. Again, you're a kid, you try to gather as much as possible very fast. So a lot of the assumptions are going to come from your parents, right? A lot of authority, they're your parents. From teachers, a lot of authority, and from what all of your friends believe, like the classroom. There's a lot of authority there too. Okay, so if you look at your parents, you might look at their relationship, and in your mind, like, okay, that's what a relationship is. That's what a relationship should be. Check, and you just store it as something you believe in. And then you go about your life, keeping that assumption alive, reinforcing it, investing in it, and building new assumptions, new beliefs on top of it. Here you are in your adult life, and let's just say your parents' relationship was very destructive. There was a lot of fighting, a lot of drama. You might find yourself attracted to someone where there's also a lot of drama in this current relationship. And consciously you're like, why do I keep falling for, I mean, a common one with women, the bad boys? Why do I keep liking the bad boys, the guys who cheat on me? Okay, links back to perhaps, again, not always, but very likely, the relationship your parents had together. The same with guys. I keep falling in love with um, girls who cheat on me, partners who leave me. Maybe as a kid, there was that distance in the relationship your parents had. Maybe your parents got divorced, got separated. Maybe that was your definition of love. So you fall for people who can't fully be there for you. People who cheat on you, um, people who uh, are long distance, like long distance relationships, people who are unavailable, people who you know, part of you knows, will leave you. And it's like this recurring pattern in your life. Okay, and here consciously you can try to think, okay, well I need relationship advice. What are the techniques to get the relationship? Until you let go of this core assumption, this core belief, it will keep repeating itself. And the resistance to letting go of it, by the way, is because if you let go of that definition of love, that definition of a relationship, that's at a core, at a foundation, and a lot of beliefs and other assumptions are built on it, it means if this is wrong, all of this crumbles, and you're left with the big unknown. That is a bearing that has kept you alive to this day, that you're very invested in, that is part of who you are. The state you're addicted to will color everything. If you're someone who's really hooked on, um, you know, we were talking about, say, fear. You're hooked in this state of fear. Um, that'll color everything that you see. You're in this room, like we're all in the same physical room, but our experience of this will change. If you're someone who's hooked on fear, you're gonna be listening to me, but you're probably gonna be thinking, okay, is anyone staring at me? Oh my God, how do I look? Like that paranoia is gonna kick in. That's what you're gonna pick up on, you know? Your RAS, your selective focus is going to pick up on things to keep that alive. If you're someone who's in a state of guilt, you're gonna find reasons to feel guilty. If you're someone who's in a state of anger, you're gonna find things that piss you off. And um, that'll also apply to a relationship. You actually won't even see the person. You're gonna filter everything that the person is of like fear, fear, fear. She's gonna cheat on me, she's gonna leave, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, the work that has to be done with you, again, the quality of the relationship you have with yourself will dictate the quality of the relationship you have with others in terms of partners, friends, and the relationship you have with the world. I like this expression, so I'll use it. What's the thing in life that really tickles your balls, that turns you on? The thing where it doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter if you ever succeed, it's the time where you felt the most alive. If you died now, what was the thing you did alive while you were alive that turned you on the most? 
you know, and, and it, might, it might not be something you've done for like years. Maybe the past 10, 20 fucking years you've been dead inside. And all you can remember is a moment during your childhood. What was that? Rekindle that. If that's, like, it's crazy. If that was the moment you felt the most alive during your childhood, what have you been doing the past 10, 20 years? You're fucking up. You're, you're dead inside. Like, what's life? Is that life if you felt the most alive only as a kid? No? If that's your realization here, switch shit up big time nowadays. Don't keep doing what you're doing. Go back to doing what you were as a kid. If that's what made you happy, if you died right now and your happiest moments were as a kid, change something. For real. Otherwise, it's all downhill. And it's scary, but it's like kind of reflect like, okay, it's scary. It might go against the, the opinions of other people and shit. But at the same time, it's like, your life's yours. You're going to die. Milk the experience that is being alive. You don't have forever. We think we do. I'll do it someday. There is, but what if there is no someday? It's not a guarantee. That's the other thing. It's like, I love this, um, this saying because it's so true. It's like, what would you do if you had a disease right now that'll kill you? Um, it could kill you. Like, say you go to the doctor. It's like, sir, what's your name? Nikita, you have cancer. I'm sorry to tell you you have cancer. We can't heal you. Um, but we can't give you a definitive timeline. You might die tomorrow. You might die in 40 years. You might die in 50 years. But you do have cancer and you will die. Would your perception change? If the answer is yes, then realize this. You all have cancer right now. It's called being alive. It's going to kill you. Being alive is going to kill you. Being alive. No one survives being alive. You all die. We fight so hard to survive. None of us survive. You can't survive. You're going to die. From that perspective, and knowing that when you die, it's like, that's your life. It's you. It's your responsibility. Like, how are you going to live it? So when you die, you're like, fuck yeah. You know? I lived life my way. I lived life, you know, on my terms. I lived a life that I milked this experience of being alive whatever that is to you, whatever that means to you. I will only love myself when I get a girl. No. I will only love myself when I make X amount of money. No. I will only love myself when this happens, when that happens. Let go of all of it. All those things can be used for inspiration, but the way we use them is just more resistance towards being ourselves. And it does more harm than good. Okay? You literally, like anything that's in the way, you need to identify it and let go of it. Detach your self-worth from the physical, from the external. Include, like, you should be okay with everything, by the way. And this gets a little freaky. You're like, well, what if I don't have any friends? Doesn't matter. Love and accept yourself. Don't use having friends as a barrier to loving yourself. Don't use anything as a barrier to loving yourself. Your intention can be towards success, having great things. But you don't need that. You already feel awesome. Okay, and this is also what allows you to enjoy the journey of a certain goal, to enjoy the journey that is life. Because there is no destination. Super cliche, I know you heard it before. It's not about the destination, it's the journey, everyone. Like, yeah, yeah, got it. You all want the destination, doesn't exist. We're all aiming for that happy ending. You've been conditioned by it with Disney movies. Prince Charming, you know, fucking Pocahontas, kids, happy ending, it's over. But, you never think about the day after the happy ending. When suddenly it's like, John Smith, you're not fucking cleaning your clothes, goddammit, do the dishes, bitch, or like all this shit and the fighting happens. No one thinks about that. They have a whole lifetime together. You don't think they're gonna argue after that? Or Beauty and the Beast, now he's human again. Make out, happy ending, and they lived happily ever after. And they argued a lot, and there was a lot of drama, and they fought, and he fucked her sister, and all this shit, you know? <laughs> they don't talk about that. <laughs> so, there is no happy ending. There is no finish line. Every time you reach it, you cross it, now there's another finish line, and another one. It's endless, okay? And what it comes down to is enjoying where you're at right here, right now. And the best way I like to illustrate this is, say you're composing a song, another Fun fact about yours truly is that I used to play a lot of guitar. I played guitar since I was the age of eight, and I composed since the age of 12. That's right. I wrote hit songs at the age of 15. 
Not many people heard them, but they were hit songs. <laughs> and um, if you've ever played an instrument or done something creative, there's always occasionally that spark of inspiration that happens. You know, when you least expect it, if you try to compose something or create something right now, forcing yourself, like, okay, compose. I don't fucking know, it, it just doesn't come. But then you just kind of like, eh, or, or you might have this in the shower and something just ignites. You're like, whoa. And then you're like, shit, this is amazing. And you just start fucking around with it. You tell your friends, say you're doing music, like, check this out. And you're like composing this amazing song. During that moment, there's a certain knowing inside of you that this song is gonna be great. And when people hear it, they're gonna love it. And when I finally record the, the, the perfect studio version of the song, God damn, it's gonna change everything, okay? But you enjoy every second of it. You're in no hurry to get there because you know it's going to happen. It's not like, oh, I'm composing. Oh, fuck this, let's just get to the end. Let's just get to the recording. No, you love every part of it and you know it's gonna happen. And that ideally is how life should be. You know everything's going well, it's all good. Enjoy the journey. I can see it in your eyes looking right here. Who the fuck is alive? Who is connected to that calling? Who is acting out of authenticity and who is just fucking dead inside? I know who you are. <laughs> dead inside, doing something they don't like something that's not authentic to them, trying to please people they don't give a fuck about. Just existing, another day, another day, I'm old, I'm dead. Okay, they have no idea, and you can also catch yourself here by how much you escape life. When you go home after work, what's the first thing you do? Uh, let's put the next Netflix show on, <laughs> the next Game of Thrones, the next movie, the next TV show, the next YouTube video. How often do you escape yourself? How often do you escape your life? We're taught that what we want, what our calling is, that little voice in the back of your head right now, to ignore it. No? From the moment you're fucking born, it's like, you shouldn't feel that way. It's like, no, 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 don't do that. Do that to please him. Do that to please her, et cetera, et cetera. You're raised as a fucking people pleaser. You're raised to literally believe that your own needs, that little voice, your little dream is completely bullshit. It's pathetic. It's a little child dream. Grow up, motherfucker. Grow up. That's what you're taught, you know? And we all have it, like, growing up. Like, I remember as a kid, and fortunately, I had some people around me that kept pushing me to keep that alive, but even I lost touch with it for quite some time. Um, but I remember like my, my grandmother, for example, would keep it, keep it alive. Like she'd see it and be like th that gift, that calling of say, being a little creative. You know, I love music, I love drawing, and she'd always encourage me. A lot of other people would be like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'm like, I don't know, maybe something in, be in a band. That's stupid, that's not mature. I'm like, ugh, like, and you start doubting yourself. And then after a while, you're like, you know what? Fuck that voice, I guess I don't know what's best for me. No? And then you start living, trying to please other people, living their dream. Most people, everything they do is for their parents and they can't drop it to this day. Um, I, another client I have on Skype, he's uh, 40 something years old and he's still run by his parents' expectations of him. Even though there's absolutely no repercussions in his life right now, there's still a feeling of guilt when he pursues something that's, say, more authentic to him. Um, he loves, for example, movies, you know, creating movies, directing movies, like that's his calling. But his mother always shamed him for it. Say, no, you're gonna be a fucking lawyer. You're gonna be a doctor. What's this movie shit, you immature cunt? Now she didn't say that, I mean, his fucking son, but, um, but that was, again, the way he was conditioned. And now, even as he's older, he's like, he's doing it, which is great, but there's still that feeling of guilt. Like, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Like she's gonna come out of the fucking corner and slap him or something. And we're run by this. And then you find yourself living this life that's not a life of your own design. It's not something you wanted. And then you're like, what the fuck? You're doing something you don't want to please people who aren't you. And you lost touch with yourself. And you've been doing it for so fucking long, you can't even connect with yourself anymore. That little voice, you should do this. Don't shove me in the corner, do this. You've been shoving in the back, shut up, motherfucker, shut up. Gone. And you can't even find that voice anymore. You can't even find that little seed just of what you could be authentically if you listen to it. And here you are just fucking lost, drifting. Yeah, anyone relate to this by the way? 
Just curious. Yeah. Absolutely insane. And, and it's the worst state to be in because you can't find a fucking way out. You know it's not this, but then you don't know what. And you're stuck. And what kind of life is that? You know? And the more you do it, the more dead inside you become. Another test to see this is what excites you? What are you passionate about? You don't know? You're not in touch with yourself. For me personally, I used to identify a lot with the self-destructive artist. That was me. Any movie, I'd just look for the person who's a little bit self-destructive. And this started from a very, very young age. And because of that, this, you could say, was part of my identity. From a young age, I'm the self-destructive artist. By doing so, I find significance. I feel important. I feel different than everyone else. From my perspective, everyone else is just following the regular route, succeeding, being the hero. I'm the self-destructive person. I'm different. I'm better. That's why you do so. You find certain significance in it. Now, once this identity is formed, I'm going to start acting from it. And every day that passes that I act from this identity, I invest in it. I'm going to start forming different beliefs, different assumptions built on this. And assumptions built on that, built on that. There's this whole structure that emerges built on the self-destructive artist. Now, consciously, let's get in shape. New Year's resolution. And you might do a little sprint using willpower, using effort. However, if I'm self-destructive, can I be fully healthy? No, because then you're no longer self-destructive. If uh, I'm self-destructive, can I have a healthy, nice, long-lasting relationship? No, because then it's no longer self-destructive. Self-destructive means you're destroying shit. Shit's exploding. There's drama everywhere. Can I be successful? No, because if I make it, I'm not self-destructive. Consciously, why, why, why? But that's why. This part of you is getting exactly what it wants. And it's a lot scarier to succeed and drop this because if you let go of this, if this is wrong, you're no longer self-destructive, everything built on it is wrong too, and you're left with the big unknown. Instead of running away from it, instead of distracting yourself, instead of trying to escape it, instead of trying to compensate for it, why not face it directly? Why not face that inner hell? And step one, just looking around here, is realizing you're not alone. And it's not, huh, if it's not just me, because that's one thing pain will do, it's like it's just you by yourself. If it's all of us, it kind of gives you that extra courage to dive into it. Because this is where like that really deep, intense work begins. You know, we think it's going out and like putting ourselves in intense situations, and that's scary as fuck. I remember my first time going up and even saying hi to a stranger, so scary. But diving into your inner demons, it's going into hell. And you got to be ready for that. But when you do, and someone asked me that before, like, what's one thing you tell me? It's like, keep going. The only way out is through. You've tried everything to avoid it. You've tried everything to run away from it. At what point are you going to confront it? You probably spend your entire life trying to fix that inner hell. Doing everything. Getting more money, perhaps. More inter you know, external results. More success. More validation. More love. More relationships. Better partner. Whatever it is. Yet, did it change that inner hell? Most likely not. It might have temporarily distracted you. It might have temporarily numbed it a bit, but that's it. If you just sit by yourself sober for a day or two, you're right back in it. If you do nothing, like this is the ultimate test, do nothing for a week. I mean, eat, obviously, and sleep. But if you do nothing, you take no substances, you don't watch TV, you don't distract yourself. You don't go out and do like all these little events. You just sit with yourself, hang out with yourself. You're right back in hell. No? Crazy. That's the thing I realized, by the way, and you might have heard me talk about this before, right before the scandal. I was like, here, I have everything. Yet if I sit alone a little too long, I'm back in hell. At what point are you like, hey, maybe this approach won't work? We live in a world of denial filled with denialists. Okay, what is a denialist? You. <laughs> Just him, no one else. Now, everyone, okay? One simple example, how you doing? Good? Good. Okay, that is a denialist. How you doing? Good. Really? You can test this. Just ask a friend, like, hey, how's it going? Good. The autopilot response. Oh, good. Uh, how are you doing? 
how's it really going? Just add that word, really. Okay, no, no, not how's it going, how's it really going? Well, I kind of feel empty inside, you know, I don't have much success with women, that's why I'm here, and I kind of hate myself, and you know, my mom has this sickness, and I'm dealing with that, and there's all this stress, and my small dick, and all this shit, and fuck, I just want to die. So you're saying that is good? Okay, that is a denialist, where basically, and it's not just you, I'm just fucking around here, it's everyone. We live in this world where everyone is walking around pretending, and this is a simple surface layer example, but we're all pretending everything is fucking peachy, everything is fine, when we have this shit inside of us that is eating us, that is controlling us, that is running us, where most of the things you do here today is run by this shit, trying to escape it, trying to change it, trying to fix it, and we're all pretending like, there is no shit inside. It's like we're all walking around on fucking fire, and we're like, we're not on fire. Are you on fire? <laughs> Hell no. So fucking chill. And it's shocking to see. Here is what it's like to be fucking you at a core. That's you. Here's your personality, a lot of which you've developed in a reaction to feeling shitty at a core. And here's your life situation. We think that more money, more friends, da -da -da, better house, better job, get older, all this shit is going to change it. It doesn't. Go a little deeper. Okay. Money doesn't buy happiness, everyone. Focus on your personality. Positive affirmation, more books, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't work. And we just keep doing that, and then we die. What we don't realize is that this comes first. These are simply the effects. This is at the cause, this affects this, this affects that. If there's one thing you take from this event is that, is this, wherever you go, there you are. Doesn't matter what you do in terms of your life situation. Doesn't matter what you do in terms of personality, there you fucking are. And reflect back on all those things you thought would change everything, those things you thought would work. When I finally get a girl, most likely you got a girl. Here you are chasing something else. When I make more money, you're making more money. Now you're chasing something else. We're always just chasing something else. It's endless. At what point are you like, what am I doing? What the fuck am I doing? When I read more books, how many books do you need to fucking read? You probably read a ton. When I do more classes, well, how many classes do you need to take? You're, what the fuck are you doing? It's really that what the fuck are you doing? But do we want to acknowledge this? No. Because it literally means acknowledging that everything you've been doing here has been a fucking waste of time. Say I give you a map. You know, here we're in Vienna. I'm like, here's a map of Berlin. Find your way around, Vienna. Are you going to find your way around? What if, and what if, you take on a very positive attitude? Are you going to find your way around? What if you, you hustle a lot? What if um, <laughs> you drink a green juice with the, the map of Berlin? Now, what if you read a lot of books? No. What if you use positive affirmations? What if, what if you're just a little more grateful? Are you going to find your way around? Nope. No, because it's the wrong fucking map. Now, let's just say you're born, and from the moment you're born, I'm like, hey, here's the map, Berlin. Go find your way around. In your entire fucking life, you're trying to find your way around Vienna using this map of Berlin. Here you are, an adult, and I come up to you. I'm like, hey, it's the wrong map. Are you going to accept that? And you'd be like, oh, thanks for telling me. <laughs> or are you going to be like, fuck that. I spent way too much energy. <laughs> I've spent my entire life trying to make this map work. I've become the map. My ego is the map. I've invested so much into this map. There is no fucking way I'm dropping it. Because it means acknowledging everything you've been doing has been completely wrong. It's literally like you've been playing like a, a gambling game and you've just your entire life put money in the pot, put money in the pot. And I'm like, hey, just let it go. You're not going to win. You're like, fuck no. All my money's in there and more. Keep going. And we just keep going. We'd rather just live in this state of denial, trying to make this map work. Because it's way too scary to let go of it. It kills your ego. And who are you without the map? 
and then we just live our lives that way. How will I know when, when I will have let go completely? Julian, we're about letting go of trauma completely. No. <laughs> I don't know why the accent, like, <laughs> liberty. Um, <laughs> weird. That's actually the, the British accent is the one accent I just suck at. I completely suck at. I can do the, uh, the French accent, very good, and the, um, uh, the Australian accent, pretty damn good, mate. Yeah. But, but British, fuck all, fuck all. Um, <laughs> but no, we do that. It's like, when will I have done that? But that's the thing. It's like, by doing that, when will I have let go completely or done so in XYZ, it's like, it means it's not right now. The truth is, you will have let go completely when that question stops arising. Why? Because the more you let go, the more you're okay with who you are here. The more you embrace who you are here. The more you embrace that you've passed the finish line. And if you embrace who you are here, there's no longer a rush to be anywhere else. The whole idea of I need to be somewhere else is based on self-hate and resistance to being you. The more you accept being you, that question will stop popping up because you won't need to escape yourself. There is the real world in which you are right here, sitting down, listening to me, watching me in this room. But then there's another world that happens where? Right in there. That's right. There is a virtual world that happens in your phone. And there are two yous. There's the you that's here, that looks the way you look, that thinks the way you think, that feels the way you feel. And there's your virtual avatar, the you that exists in a magical distant place called Instagram. Although it's a joke, it's actually very serious. There are two worlds and there are two yous. There's the real you and there's the avatar that is you. And unfortunately what happens due to the way that we're conditioned is we tend to overvalue that virtual world, that virtual reality and that virtual us, that avatar, versus the real world. What we're actually feeling, what we're actually going through, where we are here today. Okay, people undervalue real life and they overvalue fake life to the point where you don't even really care what you look like physically here like you could look like shit you wake up in the morning you're like oh fuck i look horrible oh man i look like gerard depardieu huh? <laughs> <laughs> or yeah <laughs> like that one so anyway it's like you look you could look like complete shit but you're like you know what it's okay it's okay don't worry you look like shit in the mirror and in real life but there is one place where you don't have to look like shit. All you have to do is use a filter, <laughs> right? Take a fucking Instagram pic, blast a filter, go on Photoshop, slim yourself out a bit. Oh yeah, get the fucking eight pack there. Post it on Instagram and that's what people see, right? Literally, you'll be sitting there, like behind your computer, your boxers and shit, gut hanging out, just like a piece of shit, like, oh, but on your fucking picture, you look ripped as shit. People have this on Tinder, on dating apps, everywhere. Those pictures online are so good, right? To the point where some people are afraid of even going on dates because they know, they just know that that other person's gonna be like, ugh. In social media, Instagram, Facebook videos, there's lighting. There's editing. There's a thing called Photoshop. What you're seeing most of the time is not the truth. Okay, and this one's big, say, you know, if you're trying to be healthy and you're looking at your body in the mirror and then you look at all these Instagram like workout people, guys or girls, and you're just like, oh my God, how can I have that body? What the fuck? But then you also don't realize that there's lighting and shadows. And if you were actually transported in the room where there's a lighting and shadows where they took that picture, you would look way different than you do now at home in front of the mirror. There's also something called um, fasting before a picture or the pump if you're a guy or, or girl if you're like really working out where you really like pump up some fucking blood in your muscles and you look way bigger than when you wake up in the morning. There's all these different things that we don't consider. Okay. Um, people also put out different videos like hustling 24 seven and then you're like, why am I not hustling 24 seven? I suck. <laughs> <laughs> Just because they say they're hustling 24-7 doesn't mean they're hustling 24-7. So it does reinforce a lot of unrealistic standards, unrealistic requirements that then we try to meet and we judge ourselves by. And you just can't win that game because it's not real, it's not true. Since the end of your childhood, nothing new has occurred. Now, when you hear this, what are you probably thinking? What are you talking about? My balls dropped. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Um, now, nothing new has occurred. No, you're like, well, of course, I've grown up. 
all these new experiences. I got a job now. I moved out. A lot of new things have occurred. Yes, on the surface. But looking beneath the surface, has anything really changed? The physical is changing, but is it possible that that is just an illusion? Okay, let's take this example. In a group of friends, everyone has a certain role. If we take, say, four people, five people, you all have a role. You're either the main person, the leader, you're the number two, you're the class clown, the funny one, you're the loser, the bottom person who, you know, people don't mind having around, but you always have to go out of your own way to be invited to different things. Like, say it's us four, and say you're the loser. <laughs> say I'm the loser. It's us four. If right now it's like, let's go see a movie. The leader, number two, class clown, we'll just say eh, random and loser. Let's go see a movie. Fuck yeah, let's go see a movie. Now, for us, like class clown might joke around, like, yeah, let's go see this thing and fucking joke around. We're going to stay a little quiet because our opinion doesn't matter as much. They're going to decide. And then whatever way they decide, we're like, okay. We never express it because there's not the, the status. We don't have that rank. Now, for me, if I'm like the loser of the group, you won't mind me coming along, but it won't make a difference to you whether I come along or not. You have friends like that or you might resonate with this where it's like, I'll have to text you guys like, hey, hey, I won't necessarily text the leader because that's too out of rank, but I might text you like, hey, where's the movie? What time are we going? Oh, can I come? Oh, wait for me, wait for me. You always have to catch up. And of course, when I'm there, they're like, oh, you're here, cool. But no one's going to be like, hey, where's Julian? We can't have fun without him. Whether I'm there or not, it doesn't matter. Okay? Now, we all have this role. We take it on during our childhood. But it's funny how it's so fucking hard to escape it. No? We think that when we grow up, it changes. But somehow, you always find yourself in the same role, whether it's with your friends, your new friends, or at work. Even if you move you find yourself in the same role. How many times have we heard like, when I move, it'll all change. Like say you're even someone who has no friends. You think it's gonna change when you move? Bullshit. You might delay it. You might have the first initial encounters, but eventually you will find a way back to your spot. If you're the class clown, you might delay it, put on a certain front, but eventually that new social circle, that new group of people will start labeling you as the class clown. You find your way back. Do you have experiences like this? Like, when I move, it'll be different. Nope, it's the same. So yes, it's new friends, a new social circle, a new environment, but the same underlying dynamics are still at play. Am I making my life serious and heavy and just not fun or not? All this advice, any piece, by the way, can help you or hurt you. Don't use it to hurt you. Don't use it to judge yourself, to make your life heavier. You're here to live. Remember, death on your mind. You could die at any point. Is that how you want to go? Like, well, I died, but I spent the last few years on a very strict routine. I mean, it's cool, and, and I have routines. Okay, it's not like all routine or no routine. It's have some, but also allow yourself to live. Allow yourself to also fuck around a bit. That's something I really see missing in this whole field where there was even a client I had, a Skype client, and she was saying, you know what? I had my cheat meal today. And, and I joked about it with her, but I was like, here's my cheat meal. And she was really tracking down all her habits. I was like, what do you do for fun? She's like, well, I read for fun. I'm like, oh, what do you read? Only nonfiction, self-help books that will benefit me. I'm like, okay, um, do you really socialize? Sometimes when I talk about self-help with my friends. I'm like, okay. Um, and she's like, here's my cheat meal for the week. And it's like two squares of dark chocolate with a calculated tablespoon of peanut butter on it. And I'm like, that's the saddest cheat meal I've ever seen. It's like, that was it for this week. <laughs> what? And I'm like, live, you have to live. Go out and fuck around. Go out and like party with your friends. It doesn't mean do that all the time, but like go and live. And it's crazy, you'll see this. People who, they might even, you, you might hear this. They're like, okay, I'm gonna live. I, I'm gonna even just sit down and do nothing, like watch a movie. It's fine. It's like, but what if it's not a documentary? It's fine. You don't have to always be learning. But then what you'll notice is you do this and then you start judging yourself. You're like, I should be learning. I could be learning more. I could be reading more. And you can't even enjoy relaxing, okay? You gotta do both. 
There are times where, yeah, you better be on point and you better orchestrate your life in the right way, but you can also fuck around at times. You're here to live. You're here to milk life. You're here to experience joy. Don't make it so heavy, okay? Break the rules. All these rules, spiritual rules, self-help rules, are meant to be broken at times. Not all the time, but at times. You get hooked on being broken. You get hooked on something being wrong with you. You get hooked on believing you always need healing, right? It's crazy how that works. And uh, I've been seeing this pattern come up more and more where people will even get into, say, spirituality, like letting go. And instead of using the process to let go, what do they do? They use the process as another requirement to resist who they are and to hate themselves. Okay, we all have this, a list of requirements and you know, barriers to self-love. Right now, if I ask you, do you want to love yourself? You want to feel amazing here? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Do you feel amazing? Like, well, I guess so. Could you feel better? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you feel better? Think about it. Right now, at this moment in time, there is no reason for you to not feel fucking amazing, like top of the top, like basking in self-love, like coming on the inside. There's no reason, right? There's no one sitting there next to you punching you, right? There's no reason. You're sitting here in this room. So why is it? All these requirements for me to feel at peace and awesome, this needs to happen, 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 this needs to happen. and this does not happen, and this does not happen, and this does not happen, and this does not happen. Massive attachment, massive resistance. This goes back to Buddhism. Massive attachment, massive aversion. And the whole process of letting go is releasing this resistance and attachment. However, you can also use and fall into the trap of using this process of letting go as simply adding it as another requirement. Where it's like, okay, not only do I need all of this to happen and all of this to not happen, but I also now need to let go of all of that and always be releasing and da 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 More conditions to hate yourself. Remember this, any piece of advice can be used to either help you or hurt you. Any piece can be used to love yourself or hate yourself, okay? So you cannot use this work, including self-help, as more barriers to hate yourself. And you'll see people go down that rabbit hole. It's like, well, now I need to let go. And then you get into even, say, trauma healing. Now I need to do this thing, and now I need to do this practice. And then I also learned about this practice, and I need to do that, I need to do that. In the self-help world, it's okay, well now I also need to, you know, hustle more, I need to take my supplements, I need to eat perfect health, and I need to do that, and I need to do that, and it's compulsive, and it's endless. Okay, do you ever have that? Like in the, the self-help, traditionally, it's like, I need to work out to feel amazing, but then I need to go to the sauna to detox, and now I don't feel amazing because the toxins in me, and I need all my supplements, and if I miss one supplement, God damn it, everything fucking sucks, and I don't feel the same. That's the same trap. And what is it all reinforcing? That you currently are broken. Someone who's at the bottom who believes that they're kind of down here, they don't deserve much. If you compliment them, they won't see your compliment. What will they see? A sarcastic attack, a mean remark. You walk down the street, someone's like, I like your shoes. You're gonna be thinking, fuck that noxious motherfucker. How dare they make fun of my shoes? So you don't even see it as a compliment. As you move up, you might see it as a compliment, but you have to push it away. Nice shoes, oh, these are nothing. And then, only then, would you let it land, nice shoes, thank you, right? Now, just this example, the compliment, how could this affect your life in terms of different opportunities? What are opportunities that are right there for you that could change your life in ways you cannot imagine that you don't even see as opportunities, just like that person who sees a compliment as a sarcastic insult. The limitations, the blinders we have are insane. This is why we're just stuck in the same little realm. We think that we're, we're, our life is changing. We're just running around in circles. Like for real. We think we're going up and then a little thing happens. We keep going up. But in reality, here's your, what you think you deserve. You go up and then you might pierce through it a little bit, but because it's too good for you, you fuck it up. And then you go back up pierce through it, fuck it up, pierce through it, and you have the illusion that you're moving up, but you're just staying under this line. 
Think about it. All your goals, New Year's resolutions, it's always the same shit. This year's the year I will get in shape. Does it happen? No. This is the year I will make money. This is the year I'll be more confident. This is the year I'll put myself out there more, take more risks. Stuckness. There's concentration-based meditation and mindfulness-based meditation. Concentration-based is the mainstream form of meditation, where it's like, you know what? Uh, focus on the present moment. Focus on the now. Ding. If you're familiar with Eckhart Tolle. It's the one where you ask someone, like, hey, so do you meditate? They're like, yeah, I meditate. It's part of my morning routine. I just sit there for 20 minutes. Cool. And uh, you can focus on a mantra. You can focus on a spot on the wall. Whatever it is. You're focusing, you're concentrating, and in a way, you're trying to pursue presence. Now, are there benefits to this? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. As opposed to not meditating, this is amazing. Okay? I did that for a few years, and you'll see it. It, it calms you down. Um, you're able to focus on something for a longer period of time. It's a good little escape, a vacation from your problems, but... Here's what I realized. It doesn't really address the problems. Because what happens? Say right now you're stressed. You're like, oh, I'm stressed and there's worry and fear, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the problems. Oh, I want to feel at peace. You know, I want to pursue presence. Focus on the now. There's all the problems and you're focusing on the now. Guess what? If you keep focusing on the now, eventually these problems will start fading away. They're out of your awareness because all your awareness is on the now. But then what happens if you stop focusing on the now? <laughs> right back in the problems. You feel that? It's like, during those 20 minutes, it feels great. But as soon as you're done, it's like, well, I'm back as I was before. That was a good vacation. That's what it is. So that's concentration-based. Mindfulness-based is, instead of pursuing presence, we realize presence. Instead of pursuing peace, we realize peace. How? Instead of focusing on the now, to avoid the problems, we focus on the problems. And then if you process and let go and release those problems, there's nothing pulling you away from the now or peace. Do you get it? The two approaches. Problems, I'm escaping them by focusing on the now. Or, let me focus on the problems, get rid of them, so I'm just present by default. That's mindfulness-based. But it's not very pleasant. Why? Because you're facing all those inner demons. You're facing the problems the things you're trying to get rid of by focusing on the now, by pursuing presence. And we're so used to escaping, we don't want to face those inner demons. There's compounded resistance around facing your inner problems. You've been running away from them your entire life. You know, this is probably why you're even in personal development, to fix the problems, run away from the problems. Mindfulness meditation is stop, turn, jump into the problems in order to let go of them. Focus on the stuff that's not that pleasant in order to free yourself from it. Focus on the past to free yourself from the past. Now here you hear advice too. Well, no, you know, if you focus on the past, what's going to happen? You're going to stay stuck in the past. Keep your eye on the future, right? But here's the thing. If you don't address that, you're just going to keep recreating it in the future. It doesn't mean stay stuck on the past. It's focus on it and let go of it. Okay, the same with negative thoughts. A big um, movement, which I'm sure you're aware of, is the law of attraction movement, or the positive thinking movement, right? Think positive thoughts. Now, depending on where you're at on the map, that can be amazing. If you're someone who is in a lot of self-hate and self-attack and you just feel horrible, telling that person to proactively think positively will actually give them some relief. But it doesn't truly get to the cause. Okay, you can try to convince yourself as much as you want, I'm positive, I'm positive, but there still might be that little voice in the background saying, no you're not, you loser, your mom should have aborted you. No, I'm positive, I'm positive. You gotta address that. And here's the thing with the law of attraction, whether that's true or not, based on my experience and what I've seen, I believe it's definitely true. Um, here's the thing, thoughts are active out of your awareness. If you're like, I'm positive, but they're still in the background, no, you're not, that's active. And that's why the law of attraction doesn't work for so many people. You ever find it funny? You know, think positive thoughts and you'll manifest positive things. Yet you go to these events of law of attraction and it's filled with losers. 
It's like, well, wait a minute, where is all this manifestation, yo? Well, I've got to do it a few more years. <laughs> no, it's because you don't address the stuff in the background, the stuff that's out of your awareness. Don't use positive thinking as a way to escape negativity. Positive thinking isn't something that you should do. It should just be the default when you let go of negative thinking. But to let go of it, you must focus on it. Accept that right now, you believe that you don't deserve success. If you did, you'd be fucking successful. Right now, you don't believe it. There might be parts of you that believe it, but not all that is you. There's a lot of stuff inside that might be telling you, you don't deserve that, that's not you. You're not part of the cool kids. You're not part of the successful people. You're not part of the healthy people. And if you do an audit on your life, the situation you're in, the things, let's just say the norm, you know, you can go back say a few years and just look at the norm, you know, do an audit. Look at how much money you've had over the past few years in your bank account on average. Look at your health over the past few years on average. And that average is what you think you deserve in life. That's your comfort zone in life. Okay. Now, what are you probably thinking? That's not true. I wouldn't be here. I'm here to try to get more. But until you acknowledge that, nothing will change and you will just keep being pulled back to what you think you deserve, your core identity, who you believe you are at a core. This is me and this is what I deserve when it comes to my health, wealth, and relationships. Anything more than that is not for me. This is where self-sabotage kicks in. Beneath this point, it's all good. Okay, in terms of socializing, this is when you become stifled. Right? If you talk to someone you believe is on the same level as you, same league as you, you don't run out of things to say. You don't get nervous. You talk to someone you believe you're outside their league, you don't run out of things to say. It's just kind of natural. But suddenly, when you talk to someone you believe is outside your league, you freak out. That's not me. Does not compute. Not for me. Go back to what I know. Push success away. We do this when it comes to health. This is why people go on little health sprints. They know the thing. It's like, oh, don't eat the burger. Go to the gym. They do it. And then after a while, this is not for me. This is not the lifestyle for me. And they find a way back to what they know. Okay, and the same with money. You know, you've all heard about the lottery winners who win and they spend it all, and we all think they're so dumb, right? That's what I thought for years. I was like, why is it that only stupid people win the lottery? <laughs> it, fa it was fascinating. I'm like, man, I can't wait for the day that someone who's smart wins because they would keep it. No, they all lose it. Why? That's not for me. If someone gave you more money than you're used to getting, here's the little test, okay? Here you have a certain amount that you're used to getting and a certain lifestyle. If suddenly someone gave you an extra 10K, boom. What's the first thing that's gonna go through your mind? What can I spend this on now? <laughs> to go back to what I know. And it'll be subtle, by the way. I've experienced this. When I first started boom, making more money, the first thing that went through my mind is, I need to spend this now. And literally, because I was traveling, I couldn't buy that much. Like, I could fill my suitcase, and that was it. And I just start scrolling through Amazon, looking for things that I needed, but that I didn't know that I needed yet. You know, if you've ever done that, you're kind of scrolling, like, is there anything I need? Anything that pops up that I'll realize I need? That is the ultimate form of like trying to go back to what you know. You don't have to spend the money. There's nothing you really need. It's like, oh, it's, it's Amazon Prime Day. Got to scroll through and find something. <laughs> Insane, right? Some of the questions you want to ask yourself is, number one, why do you hate success? Why is success bad? Why is success scary? Why don't you deserve success? Why is that not for you? And the hardest part here will be to get past the autopilot, success is for me, okay? Of course it is, I'm not saying it isn't. I'm saying track the parts of you that believe it's not for you. You don't see the world as it is, you see it as you've been conditioned to see it, okay? Really sit down with this. You don't see the world as it is right now. The way you, you're, you're all looking at me, you don't see me the same way as your neighbor and that person's neighbor and that person's neighbor. You're all seeing this weird morph version of me, okay? If you're someone who, 
let's just take this example, loves me, you're probably seeing me with the fucking glitter Instagram filter, hearts flying out, and you're like, God damn, I just want to suck him off. You know, that, like that's your reality right now. That's what you're seeing. If you're someone who's not a fan of me, you're probably like, you know what? He's actually pretty short. What's he talking about? Fuck that guy. You know, that's what you're seeing. You're probably seeing me a little shorter than I actually am. We all filter things that way. Going even deeper, it depends on how you feel. If you're someone who feels anxious a lot, you're gonna be filtering this room with, oh man, are people staring at me? What are they thinking about me? What about the people behind me? You know, are they judging the back of my head? Holy shit. That's what you're gonna experience, okay? If you're someone who's angry, you might look for reasons to be angry. You're like, you know what, the AC's a little loud. I don't know about this fucking temperature. I don't know about the lighting. Eh, these, these chairs are not the most comfortable. Oh, and tomorrow I gotta talk to my boss, fuck that. It's like, that's your reality, okay? Now, you could say, okay, that there's you, there's the world as it is, and then there's the frame. Another way of viewing it is you're wearing different sunglasses or glasses with different filters. Now, that was a simple example, but let's go back to your reality. And let's go back to not only the fact that you're not seeing the world as it is, but what conditioned the glasses you're wearing? What has affected the glasses you're wearing? What are the glasses? Okay, here's one that we all have. You can view these glasses as being programmable. We all have, I'm not good enough, programmed into them. Literally, you're born and they put those glasses on, it's like, you're not good enough. This happens due to the way that you're conditioned. This happens also because everyone else believes it as well. So those are the glasses you put on. That's the frame through which you view the world and the frame through which you've lived your life to this day. Now, you could also be in school as a kid and have someone tell you you're stupid. Here's one example. A teacher's like, you know what, you're dumb. And you might believe it. And guess what? Now that is programmed into the glasses that you're wearing. And you're filtering the world from that day through this lens of, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid. Okay? Here's another example. Let's just say there's a movie you're really excited to see. Here's two ways of experiencing that movie. And it could be any movie. Let's just say a movie you're super psyched to go see. You're like, holy shit, I can't wait. And let's just say, walking into the theater, people are walking out, and you hear, eh, it wasn't that good. Now guess what? That seed is planted. That affected the glasses. The lens has changed and when you're watching that movie, it's gonna be in the back affecting what you see and how you experience the movie. You're gonna be looking for things like, you know what, maybe the lighting here uh, was, is not as good as it could be. I can see why those people said it wasn't that good. You're gonna be looking for reasons for it to not be that good. Okay, just hearing that influenced your experience watching the movie. Now on the flip side, Someone could be walking out and be like, you know what, that was the best movie ever, way better than the last ones. And that will also affect how you experience the movie. Make sense? Okay. Now, this is happening left and right. And this is where it all starts. You gotta sit down and ask yourself, what glasses am I wearing right now? What am I seeing? And you can do an audit on your life, but if you don't analyze that, you will more often than not just end up stuck. The default is people fail at life. It's harsh to say, but it's true. You wanna know why it's true? Going back to those little Instagram videos, what's one that gets passed around all the time? It's the motivational deathbed video, right? Where you see some old people talk about their regrets. They're like, you know, I wish I would've allowed myself to be happier. I wish I would've allowed myself to, you know, follow my dreams. It's always the same too, right? And it's just a variation of old people saying that. And there's some little music and you're just like, oh, it's so inspiring. Yeah, you know, it's important to follow my dreams and to allow myself to be happy. And then you just scroll to the next video and you forget about it, okay? <laughs> but in the moment, it makes sense. <laughs> but take in just the sadness of that video. We see it, we're like, oh, the old people on their deathbed. No, those old people fucked up. <laughs> they messed up, you do realize that. The last thing you wanna be in this world is ending up on that video. When I see those old people on that video, I'm like, please never, ever let that be me. That is the ultimate sign of failure. Failure in a dictionary, the old people in that video. <laughs> Literally, they wasted their lives away. Now, what's an even bigger failure is you seeing that video and then wasting your life away. They didn't see themselves in the video. They didn't know, you know. You see the warning, it's always the same two things. Jumping at opportunities, following my dreams, allowing myself to be happy. 
yet 99.987% of people ignore it. That's the default. People fail. They live lives of regret, and when they die, they're like, oh, I was so stupid, I messed up. Very, very few people on their deathbed are like, you know what? That was a great life. I did it. When do you see that? Never. Yeah, never. It's crazy, right? And we're like, well, I'm modeling my friends. Look, they're not doing it. Joe at work, Sally at work, they're not doing it. So I guess it's fine. You know, I'm just going to be with the pack. I'll be safe. I'll be protected. No, the pack fails. You got to stand out. Don't do what the norm does. Say I have right now GTA 20. Okay, it's not out yet, it'll come out in many years, it's the most amazing, immersive GTA game ever. I'm going to lend it to you, but in seven days, I want it back. Okay, now you're going to have that game, you're going to go home, you're probably going to play, right? Are you going to be excited to play that game? Yeah. yeah? 20 years from the future, you're like, oh, you're going to put it on, and now you're in GTA. Most likely, you have seven days, you're going to go explore, you're going to try everything, right? It's this crazy new world. You're like, what happens over there and there? Let me explore. See the mountains. Whoa. And then you return it. And when you give it back, I'm like, cool, did you enjoy it? What did you do with the game? You're like, I explored. Think of life that way. Here is life. You come into life. You have your body. That's the vehicle. Here's the ride. Eventually, you're going to have to give the game back, the game of life. What are you going to tell the person when you give it back? They're like, so did you enjoy life? What did you do? Well, I kind of coped through it the entire time. <laughs> oh, that's like saying, so what do you do at GTA? Well, I just kind of stood still the whole time, and I didn't really explore because it was a little scary, and yeah. Or people who compromise their happiness or their purpose. It's like, well, I wanted to pursue this and explore, but... You know, I just played the, the taxi cab thing where I would just collect cash the whole time. And, and I had a lot of cash at the end. Did you have fun? Did you do what you loved? No, but I collected a lot of cash with the taxi missions. Ugh. Treat life that way. Here you have life. You're in the game. It started. How are you going to play this game so that when you have to give it back, you're like, that was awesome. Or are you just going to hold it back and cope and play it in this very sheltered way or just run in a building and just hide in the building in GTA, which is unfortunately what most people do in life, you know? And you don't get a warning. Keep that in mind. Well, you do when you're born. We think that we will know when our time is near. That's not true. You know your warning? You're born. Everyone here is born. You're going to die. That's your warning. You know, people are, this too, I find it, crazy like when people find out like man what would change if you know I found out that suddenly I had a disease that was gonna kill me you know I'd finally do this 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 I'm like how do you not realize you have a disease right now you all have a disease you know what it is called being alive no one escapes none of us get out of here alive you all die and this disease it'll kill you a hundred percent of the time and it could kill you today it could kill you next week, it could kill you in 50 years, but it is going to kill you. We have, we have clients that die yeah. because we work with so many people. Yeah. Friends. Friends. Yeah. Start opening your eyes to death. Not in this like sad where you're like, oh, so on and so forth, but like align yourself with reality. Yeah, I promise most of you are very disassociated from your eventual death. Vast majority of you, not real to you at all. And it's not necessarily in this like sad, gloomy way either. It's just more so live a life that's congruent to reality, not fantasy. In we fact, live, the, the awareness yeah. of death is actually the main thing that should make you happy. Yeah. In reality, it's also that scarcity that allows you to take in the experience that is life more deeply. You know, say you had all the time in the world, you'd be like, you're going to live forever and ever. Ugh. It's the scarcity where you're like, let me enjoy this. Like, say right now, I'm like, you are going to die in one minute. You're probably going to be like air, what it feels like to breathe, what it feels like, oh, like you immerse yourself, like the experience of this life is much more intense because of that scarcity. So it's not so much that scarcity is bad, it allows you to really take in what life is, but don't be blind to it. You aren't here forever. Stop living like you're going to be alive forever and then die and end up in one of those Instagram videos. I call these shadow questions, if you're familiar. It's like, you know, subconscious, unconscious, the shadow, whatever you want to call it, those two worlds inside of you. You have to ask the questions that'll give you the data to dive into and let go of. So here's an example. Why are you not good enough? Now, what does the mind do? I am good enough. And that's why it's called a shadow question. Yes, you are good enough. 
What you have to identify is the answers that shoot up. That little voice in the background. Well, you're not good enough. You can even repeat it to yourself. And it's like, because of this, 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 this. Don't shut that voice down. Take notes. Be like, okay, what else? Now you have the stuff to work on. Here's another shadow question. Why do your parents not love you and it's entirely your fault? Now again, what does our mind do? No, that's a super dark question and it's not true. It's not about being true or not. What answers shoot up? That's stuff to dive into. And you've got to get past that resistance to diving into the negativity. I must only think positive thoughts. It's like, yo, if there's a part of you that thinks that and there's an answer that shoots up, until you address it, it's going to run you. You've got to be aware of all those negative things to free yourself from those negative things. Why do you hate yourself? There's another one. Why do you not deserve success? Why do you deserve to suffer? Why is life hard for you? Why are you unlovable? Why are you toxic? Those are amazing questions to start bringing some of that up. It's audit, release. Audit, release. While taking action, that formula will change your life. There's different advice for different people at different levels of their journey, okay? Um, in self-help, it's great. You find out about things like social momentum is an example. Right? It's like, hey, if I'm thinking a lot, if I just minimize time in between some interactions, uh, my mind won't have enough time to kick in. Does that work? Yeah, to a certain amount, but it never fixes the problem, right? You never get to the cause as to why is your mind kicking in and overthinking. You're just trying to battle it. The same with people who have social anxiety, right? What's the traditional approach to social anxiety? Doing social anxiety challenges. Progressive desensitization. Will you temporarily feel a little bit more comfortable socially if you put yourself out there in different social anxiety situations and challenges, yes or no? Yes. Yeah. You put yourself in front of, say, if you're scared of public speaking, you go in front of a crowd, you do it enough, you'll desensitize yourself to it. But only to a certain amount and only as long as you keep doing it. As soon as you stop doing the challenges, what happens? You fall back to ground zero. So what's your solution? If you're like, well, I'm doing anxiety challenges every day. I hear people say that. I go out in the street and I do my little challenges and I talk to some people and I sing a song and people judge me and now I feel very free. I'm like, okay, well, you're gonna do that till you're 80? Is that your solution? To stay confident, you're gonna be like the 80 year old grandparent, like you're going out and do my challenges. No, it doesn't work. It only works so far. It never gets to the cause as to why do you have social anxiety to begin with? Right? The same with you, with like consistency, self-sabotage, you feel like you keep being pulled back. People will tell you like, okay, well, you know, put good habits in place and different boundaries so you just don't have a choice. Yeah, but it never addresses that thing that just keeps pulling you back. Or you at the front, it's like, well, maybe I can force myself to drop the front or come up with techniques to be more, you know, re it's like, no, why do you have the front? So, so much of self-help never gets to the cause, right? The same with, um, you know, things like affirmations, oh, affirmations. I am awesome, I am awesome. D does that help? Okay, now you could say temporarily, it could, but if a part of you deep down inside believes that you're not, it doesn't matter how many times you tell yourself you're awesome, you're still gonna think that you're not. We all have that voice in the background like, I am great, no you're not. I am great. No, you're not. But someone told me if I said it 200 times, maybe it would work. After 200 times, try it. That voice is still gonna say, no, you're not after, okay? It doesn't get to the cause. The biggest takeaway is you must get to the cause, okay? Now, do these bits of advice, like I said, help temporarily? Yes, they help in a certain paradigm, and this is important. It's the difference between techniques and paradigms, okay? Techniques versus paradigms. Paradigm, you could say, is the reality, the map, the situation, right? For example, here's a paradigm of you having social anxiety. In this paradigm, for someone who has social anxiety, does it help to do social anxiety challenges and to progressively desensitize themselves to it? Yes, right? But you're still in the paradigm of having it. The key is instead of looking for techniques within that paradigm, drop it and move to a paradigm where you just don't have social anxiety. And you don't need all those challenges and techniques. I'm sure you've heard that term, getting triggered, right? It's passed around everywhere. It's like <laughs> there's triggered memes and stuff. But if you think about it, what is getting triggered? It's when your response is disproportionate to reality. Okay, 
Your buttons are being pushed. If I take you, you know, any of you, like <gasps> you, and I bring you up here in front, and I make you sing a song, you're probably going to freeze. For a lot of people, public speaking is like close to death. They freeze like, <gasps> and it's like, sing. And they're like, <gasps> like, so like freaking out. Now, is their response proportionate to reality? No. no. Is their life at risk? No. The same with a lot of social anxiety, right? I've seen it for years. It's like, hey, go say hi to that person. <sighs> Hanging on to me. And I'm like, come on, go say hi. And they're like, no. It's like, is their life at risk? I guess it depends where you live, but in most cases, no, right? So it's a disproportionate response to the situation at hand. Now, to be clear, is there some realistic social anxiety? Yeah, you could say it's not necessarily 100% comfortable. There's situations where there are, oh, there's a little bit of pressure, but so much of the responses that people get, the reactions, is simply them getting triggered. And they treat that as if it's real. It's like, oh, go say hi. And like, well, that's a real fear. What can I do? And if you assume it's a real fear, and then you try to find techniques, what happens? It reinforces it, and you're stuck. OK? So understand that whenever you're getting triggered, whenever your response is disproportionate to reality, it's because something inside of you that you've disowned is being poked at. OK? So let's break this down, and this is key. You've heard me most likely talk about trauma a lot, right? And it's a big word. You hear it, you're like, wow, trauma, that's some serious stuff, right? Uh, you might look back at your childhood, your past, and you're like, well, I've had a pretty cushy past. No trauma there, right? A lot of people believe that. My past was pretty cushy too, right? Good family in Switzerland, loving parents still together. Do you think I had trauma? Yes or no? Of course, because everyone has trauma. And it comes down to understanding what is trauma. It's, of course, some big word, and we think, oh, trauma is like abuse and violence and stuff, and is that traumatic? Yes. But what we fail to realize is that trauma is anything that's just too overwhelming for us to handle, and that depends on the person and their perception of the world. As a kid, you don't know everything about the world. If you're lost in a grocery store, it could feel like you're about to die. That can be traumatic. As a kid, being told, hey, don't do that, can be traumatic. If you depend on your parents for survival, your parents saying, don't do that, you interpret it as them yelling at you. If they yell at me, they don't love me, they could abandon me, I die. Traumatic. So we all experience trauma. It's part of the human condition, you could say. And what happens is when we experience it, in order to survive, we're going to disown either the experience altogether or a certain aspect of ourselves, right? If you were loud in school and the whole class shamed you or laughed at you, right? You might be like, this is the world. The whole classroom's the world. I'm going to die. So you take the part of you that's loud and it's like, never again. That's not me, right? Putting yourself out there socially, <gasps> let's never do that again. Social aspect of me, never. Loud, expressive, never. And we have this split inside. And then as you grow, there's layers and layers of resistance that get added to it. It compounds. And here you are in your adult life. Logically, if you look at the situation, no reason to freak out. Go say hi. Because <gasps> that part of you that you disowned back then gets poked at, gets triggered, and shoots up closer into your awareness. And the same survival instinct, the same <gasps> I'm going to die that you experience when you disowned it resurfaces. And we treat that as real fear. Or, as soon as you get triggered, you try to desensitize yourself to it. And that's why it doesn't work. And people will say, well, you just got to live with it. It doesn't get better, but that's just how it is. No. Get to the cause, reown what's being poked at, and now guess what? Those situations don't push your buttons anymore. You're free from it. And you're left with the realistic, appropriate response to reality. You can do this audit with your life. Analyze your life. Where is my response disproportionate to reality? And you'll see small situations where you're just triggered, right? Someone cuts you off in traffic, and you're like, oh, and start going off. You're like, well, that was disproportionate to reality. There's one. For a lot of people, it's a breakup. They're run by a breakup years later. 
That's not an appropriate response to reality. You'll see people even remarry, right? Old people, they're like, my first wife is still triggered by it. <laughs> is it sad to go through a breakup? Of course, but not something that should ruin and run your life, right? The same with you sitting at home alone. For a lot of people, they just can't spend time with themselves because all that stuff starts bubbling up. That's not an appropriate response to reality. It's a subtle version of you getting triggered. And if you just look at your life like, huh, what if life didn't push my buttons, suddenly possibilities open up and it's just like this very freeing view of the world. You're like, wow, I'd be so free. And it all comes from diving into this and processing and releasing what's getting poked at. Now that being said, doing social anxiety challenges, I personally love it. But my approach is very different. Most people do challenges to desensitize themselves. Instead, why not do challenges to proactively trigger yourself? Because when you're triggered, whatever is down there comes closer into your awareness. You could say this is what you're aware of, this is what you're not aware of. Way down here is all the things you disowned. And it's a lot easier to catch up here than down there. Okay, so in what I teach with Transformation Mastery, it's action, trigger, release, repeat. That's the formula. You want to proactively be triggering yourself through action to then release whatever gets triggered and be free from it. So say you take social anxiety, you can do social anxiety challenges. Put yourself in situations and suddenly <gasps> the disproportionate response to reality kicks in. Great, catch it, let go of it, and repeat until you're free from it completely. This is what has personally gotten me those results I've been after for so long. Say this is you. Okay. And this is success. And you're trying to go there consciously. You're like, that's what I want. And you know the action steps. However, inside of you, there's a little, this is my horrible drawing, demon, right? A little demon in you. And that demon's saying, nah, you know what? Failure. Let's go there. And it's like this tug of war. People experience this whenever you say, like you said, I'm going to do it for 30 days and do this and do the good habits. And eventually, you get pulled back. It's like this invisible force inside of you. People do it with New Year's resolutions to the point where it's now this joke. No one takes it seriously. Like, of course you're going to give up New Year's resolutions. No one sticks to it. So we do temporary sprints. And we all have this force inside of us that pulls us back. And what we try to do is we're like, hey, let's discipline this. Willpower, work ethic, discipline. That part of me that keeps pulling me towards failure, let's just whip it into shape. That's work ethic. Does it get to the cause? No. You know what it does? Just makes that little demon even more mad. Instead, what about identifying the part of you that is pulling you here, identifying why, what's keeping this alive, letting go of it, so that there then is no more demon, and you're just aligned and pulled towards success. Instead of having this tug of war, why not just align everything? Instead of work ethic, cultivate a work magnet. Screw work ethic, that's just you beating yourself up, addicting yourself to self-hate, a horrible experience of the present moment. Bring your awareness to the core beliefs you have around money. What comes up when you hear the word money? A lot of people even have like trouble talking about money. Just this topic, they're like, oh, this is a little uncomfortable. I don't like talking about money. Oh, let's just keep it uh, chill. It's like talking about religion or politics. You're taught from a young age, don't ever talk about that. Keep it very chill. The same with money. Don't talk about how much money you make. Don't you dare ever ask anyone how much money they make. It's very taboo, right? But for real, what comes up around money? If you had to write down money equals, how would you fill in the blanks? Money equals dot, dot, dot. Now, that's beautiful. Someone's like, freedom. And that's the conscious thoughts. Oh, what's money? Freedom, you know, abundance, so on and so forth. But I did a challenge recently, and these were the beliefs that did come up when people are being true with themselves, when they're being honest with themselves. This is what came up around money. 
Money equals scarce. There's not much of it. Money equals sacrifice. To make money, you've got to make sacrifices. It doesn't come easy. Money is evil. Money is bad. Money requires a lot of effort. You've got to put in a lot of work. If you look at your life right now and you're not putting in a lot of work, money is not for you. People who make money, they work a lot. They're very disciplined. Money is scary. There's a lot of responsibility when you have money. People are out to get you. They want your money. Money equals being a sellout. You gotta compromise your authenticity. If you do what you love, you won't make money. Money is greed. Only greedy people make money. Are you selfish? Those are the people who make money. They only care about themselves, not others. Money is not spiritual. That's actually a really common one, pumped in the spiritual world. If you're spiritual, you give up all material possessions. Go live in a hut. Give up all money. You can't be spiritual and have money. You gotta look like a bum. Only homeless people can be spiritual. <laughs> money is toxic. It poisons relationships. It's not good for you. Money is hard to get. You can get it, but it's very hard to get. Money takes a long time to get. You can't get it fast. It requires years of effort, years of discipline, years of work, years of mastery. Money equals a lot of stress. Money equals a lot of pressure. Money, like having a lot of money, is unfair to others. You're screwing other people over by making money. Money is dangerous. Money corrupts. Money attracts and creates problems. That's what comes up. And funny enough, this is how a lot of us are conditioned. If I ask you, what do you think about the 1%? Great people? You like the 1%? No, there's whole movements that hate the 1%. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think 1%? You think greedy people, Donald Trump, Wall Street, bankers. They're selfish, they're screwing people over, they keep all the money for themselves. Did you know that most of the money in the world was controlled by a small group of individuals? The 1%, if they only shared, guess what? We'd solve like hunger problems in the world, we'd solve poverty in the world, it's all the 1%. Anyone here hate the 1%? <laughs> now if there's a part of you that's like, yeah, you know, screw the 1%. Um, <laughs> You might be in groups that hate the 1%. You might see articles saying, ah, oh, the 1% added again. Here's the catch. If you don't like the 1%, you are guaranteeing a future where you remain quite poor financially. You will not allow yourself to become wealthy. Why? Because guess what? If you think that being wealthy, being the 1% is bad, those are corrupt people. Now, to be clear, are there corrupt people in the 1%? Of course, of course. But there are corrupt people everywhere. What I'm saying is, what does it do to your psychology? If you think the 1% is the worst people ever, will you allow yourself to be wealthy? No, because if you allow yourself to be wealthy, who do you become? The 1%. You become one of those greedy people, the people who ruin the world, the people who are selfish, who keep the money, the people who cause world hunger. Do you want to be that? No. <laughs> Someone's like, yes. No. And this is the key. This is what you really have to bring your awareness to when it comes to core beliefs, is that there is a part of you, unconsciously, that is pushing money, that is pushing success away. Consciously, of course, you want to make money. But if there's a part of you that's like, mm, money is bad, 1% is bad, you're going to push it away because you don't want to be bad. Okay. Another example is, you know, money is a lot of responsibility. You might believe that. You know, to make a lot of money, you need to be very disciplined, dedicate a lot of time, be very focused. And you might look at your life and be like, well, I'm not very focused. I'm kind of a lazy person. What do I do in my free time? I come home after my job, after my studies. I throw on some Netflix and I chill, right? I put Netflix a bit, masturbate a bit, put YouTube a bit, masturbate a bit, <laughs> get a little tired, eat a bit, masturbate some more, put some Netflix on and pass out. Now. This is funny in a way, but it's also quite sad because a lot of those laughters are laughters of recognition. And I know this. Well, one, 
my past, when I was very miserable, that was a lot of my days, I was trying to escape my days, where I'd come home and literally it was like food, TV, masturbation. And I also know this because literally a lot of the clients, 95% I'd say, that's how they spend their free time. I asked them, what do you do in your free time? It's like, well, I come home and I watch YouTube. YouTube's a big one. And it's, I guess, better than Netflix because you're learning. And then it's uh, masturbate, YouTube, and sleep. Every day. That's their lives. If they audit their day-to-day -day life, it's obligations, whether it's job studies, and then porn, Netflix, YouTube, sleep. It's quite sad, okay? But say that's you, that's your life. You look at it, you're like, well, am I very disciplined? No, you know, I can't even keep my hand. Gosh. I don't think uh, money's for me. If money only goes to people who are very disciplined and work a lot, and I don't work a lot, then it's not for me. And that reinforces that belief, and guess what? Part of you is going to push money away, right? If you believe money corrupts people, this is common in the, um, artistic world. If you're someone who's very artistic, you might be a musician, so on and so forth, or an artist, you're like, you know what? I don't want to sell out on my art. And there's a certain pride in being poor. Where you're like, okay, well, I, I see some people make money, but this is what keeps my art authentic. I don't want money. I don't want to sell out my art. Look at all those musicians. As soon as they put their first record or two records out and they blow up, their records just go downhill. Money corrupts their craft. So I'm going to push it away to stay the poor artist because that's my identity. That is me. So it's very important to bring your awareness to these core beliefs. And don't give yourself the right answer. Give yourself the real answer. Because right off the bat, if you think about it, like someone said, money is freedom. You write it down like, money, here's all the good things about it. But how do you really feel? Money. Here's another audit. How do you feel when you see someone making money? Do you feel triggered? Do you feel jealous? Do you feel angry? Or do you celebrate that person making money? This is something I would see where, um, you know, say you're at an event. I went to a Tony Robbins event. This is a few years ago. It's Business Mastery. Amazing event. However, the whole event is him sharing, of course, some content. There's different speakers. But everyone's selling their program at the end of their speech. And I would hear some people get a little upset by that. They're like, oh, why are they selling the program? We're here. And I'm like, well, I, I guess that could be a concern. If there was no value and all they were doing was selling, I guess it's a concern. But why are you happy for them making money? Why does that trigger you? Why are you like, oh, they shouldn't be selling? Why are you celebrating when you see someone make money? Because chances are, if you resist seeing someone make money, what are you doing for yourself? Same thing. There's that same resistance to you succeeding. When I see someone being happy, I don't, I'm not like, oh, why are they so happy? I'm like, great. That's awesome. I see someone winning. Great. That's awesome. But that's not the default. For most people, it's like, why are they happy? They shouldn't be happy. Don't they know? Why are they making money? They're stealing it. They're selfish trying to make that money. It's supposed to be great. You know what? Great. Win. The more we win, the better. And what does that also reinforce? A lot of scarcity around money. We think that if one person makes money, it's taking money out of our pocket. Well, if they make it, they made it all. No more for me. But that's not true. So this is very important. As a first audit, sit down with yourself and do this at home. Write down money equals and just see what flows out. Don't judge it. Don't give the right answer. It's like, how do I feel? What's it like to date you? We never think about this, right? We're like, no, the most important is the relationship with my mom and family. No, it's you. You're stuck with you the rest of your life. And guess what? That relationship is going to dictate every other relationship. Whether it's romantic, friendship, you name it. The relationship with yourself dictates the relationship you have with the world. And it's important to do this audit. How do you like hanging out with yourself? Are you kind to yourself? Are you rude to yourself? Do you get in fights with yourself? Is there a lot of drama with yourself? What's that inner voice like? Do you ever do things that are loving towards yourself? Acts of kindness towards yourself? What's it like to date you? You must work on yourself. Until you develop a healthy relationship with you, you will not be able to do so with others. Okay, you must fill your own cup, and you must reach a point where you feel complete. And this goes against mainstream advice, which is, as you were previously asking, find someone who completes you. You know what, people? There is such a thing as a soulmate, and there's one out there for you. 
When you were born, you were a star, and that star got split in two. And you arrived here, and your other half is somewhere out there in the world. And the most beautiful thing in the world, true love, is when you find the other half of that star, and you're finally reunited. And the relationship is beaming with light and love and wonder. And you're like, hmm, my soulmate. But then there's also the worries. What if my soulmate's in another country? How will I find my soulmates with all the people in the world? Right? How will I ever live just being a half? How will I ever be whole? What if I settle for the wrong person and never find my soulmate? Screw that. Okay? There is no other person who will ever complete you. Screw this you complete me mentality. Complete yourself. Don't attach your self-worth to someone else. It's no different than attaching your self-worth to money. Looking for someone to complete you is like someone thinking, you know what, when I make millions, I'll finally be good enough. Or approval. When I have all these people approving of me, I'll finally be good enough. It's no different. What is love? It's when two complete people come together and there's a certain synergy that happens. Not two halves that come together. If it's two halves, you will not experience love. You will experience attachment. You will experience craving. You will experience need. And this is what most of society confuses with love. Most people have never experienced love. They only experience need. Obsession. Desperation. As soon as they're away from their partner, they're replaying, like, oh, my partner, I need my partner. Oh, I to get my partner attracted. Oh, I talk to my partner, my partner. It's like this pulsive need. It's like their drug. And guess what? If that is what your relationship is built on, it will by default be filled with manipulation. Manipulation, bribes, trying to get the other person to do what you want. Why? Because you don't want to lose that person. If you found your half and you're finally complete, do you want to lose half of you? No. And it won't even be consciously. But unconsciously, you're going to try to find ways to keep that person there. And they're going to do the same. It won't be love, it'll be manipulation and attachment. That's what a relationship is when you come at it from a place of being incomplete, when you come at it from a place of desperation. And we're conditioned by this too. We see it in the movies, in TV shows, it's all this attachment and craving, but that is toxic. Let it sink in. Attachment is toxic. Attaching your self-worth to another person is toxic. And vice versa. You are complete. And you can even sink into this perspective. Can you be okay with never being in a relationship the rest of your life? See what comes up. I'm not saying don't get into a relationship. Life is all about relationships. But what comes up sinking into that perspective? What if you never find anyone? What if you're alone the rest of your life? Can that be good enough? Can you be okay with that? If the answer is no, whatever comes up, that is something you must let go of. Those are things that are driven by, I am incomplete, I am not good enough, just me. I need someone else. You've placed another person as a requirement to you being whole, to you loving yourself. I can only love myself fully if I'm in a relationship. No. Become whole first. There are two approaches to doing this. One is to let go of everything that's keeping this map alive. This is how you produce true, permanent, long-lasting change. The other is to use a more external approach to get glimpses of this other map, glimpses of that higher state. People experience a glimpse of that higher state at various live events. It's known as a seminar high. You come into it, you're in this very low state. You feel very miserable. Your thoughts are just reinforcing the state. Everything you do is reinforcing the state. You come to a live event, you might get snapped into a higher state. And you leave the event, you're like, wow, I feel great. Now, people think that's going to last. No, a seminar high never lasts. But it's not bad. It's not meant to last. If change was that easy, uh, you, none of you would be here. Everyone would be happy. If a seminar high was meant to last, everyone would be happy. You just go to a seminar and then last for life. <laughs> no. You can't avoid confronting and letting go of the things that run you at a core, deep down inside. But you can use seminars highs to huh, kind of zoom out of that map and just see beyond the clouds. You're like, whoa, 
there is another way of being, another reality. When you have a seminar high, your thoughts are also very different. Take that in. Use it as a reminder. Write down the thoughts you have when you're in that higher state. Because guess what? Because this is at the cause, this will also hijack your focus, your thoughts, and your life. It hijacks everything. I'm not good enough. I want to be good enough. I don't feel whole. I want to feel whole. Um, I don't feel very confident, happy, secure within. I want to feel happy and secure. Let's do it. But this approach does not work. Okay. Why? Because the more you're trying to say, become enough, at the same time, you are telling yourself that you are not good enough to begin with. Only someone who believes they are not good enough is trying to become enough. Only someone who believes at a core that they are not confident is trying to become confident. Only someone who's not happy is trying to become happy. The more you're trying to become happy, the more you're telling yourself, I'm not happy, I'm not happy, must become happy, I'm not happy. And it's endless. You cannot get there that way. Now, an approach, unfortunately, that some people take is they give up on this. They realize, ah, oh, I guess it doesn't work. Here's what I'm gonna do instead. I'm not good enough. Um, how can I bring down to my level? I have low self-esteem. How can I bring other people's self-esteem down to my level so then I feel at ease and in sync with the world and I do feel good enough because we all feel horrible. <laughs> Screw that. So this is a lot better than the alternative, but it doesn't work. Question the assumption. What does that mean? Why do you assume by default that you aren't good enough? Why do you assume that by default you aren't confident? What if you actually are? What if you've bought into a lie? What if different things might have conditioned you to believe in this lie? And instead of reinforcing this lie by acting from it, question it, and perhaps the way there is to let go of all the things that are keeping this lie alive. And that is the approach we're taking here. This is why you hear me talk about letting go so much. What if you are enough? What are all the things that are telling you I'm not good enough to begin with? Past trauma is an example, the way you've been conditioned, different things you've suppressed or repressed, different core beliefs, core assumptions, the core identity you've unconsciously taken on. All those things keep it alive. You could say state is, I'm up here. We all had it. Like, you might be out socializing, you just get in a flow, and you just feel good, like everything's clicking, right? So, this is where you want to be, this is state. And when you feel state, there's a click, this equals this, and you're like, boom, soaring. But then some nights you go out, and you feel down here. And this, there's, no, there's not the, the equal anymore. You're like, no. But what about this? Remember this, as soon as you can feel good being out of state, you're in state. Because state isn't about being up here, state is about the equal. If you're down here and you felt okay being down here, you reach the same equal. So as this changes, as what you feel changes, just keep being okay with it, creating the equal. When it comes to apathy, there's a client who is actually from Austria and I was on a call with him. And uh, to book his first call, it took like a few weeks. And I kept messaging him, hey, here's the schedule, book your call, let's get it going. And after a few weeks, I email him, I'm like, hey, get on Skype, let's do this, what's going on? Why do you keep procrastinating? Why do you keep putting it off? And he answers, hey, sorry, my mom just passed away. So I felt really bad, I was like, oh my God, oh, sorry man, like, take your time, completely understand, let me know if I can help. Uh, the call may help, we can dive into some of it. And he answers, oh no, it's cool. Yeah, just, I'll just jump on. And I'm like, that's a little casual for what just happened. Um, and then we get on the call and I'm expecting him to be all torn up, emotional, and he was just very logical, very Austrian, very German, just da 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 da, -da. <laughs> and, uh, and I told him like, so would you like to talk about what happened? He's like, well, I guess so, but you know, life's life. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean life's life? Like, your mom just passed away. He's like, yeah, but, you know, it, it happens. I'm like, do you, do you, what do you feel around it? He's like, well, you know, people are born, people, go. just this very logical thing. <laughs> and 
diving into it, I found out that his father passed away five years prior to that. And when his mom passed away, he said he didn't really cry, maybe a little bit of a tear. The only time he cried before that was five years ago, a little bit when his dad passed away and he can't remember before that. And he's like his whole life, he's just been chasing different degrees, getting his bachelor's, his master's, his PhD, so on and so forth. Really smart guy, really intellectual guy, but everything is filtered through logicality. It's all just mental. Do you feel anything in terms of your mom passing away? Well, mentally, check, 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 check. What's the purpose of life? Well, mentally, get bachelor, get master, get PhD, get job, keep it going. And everything was like that. I'm like, what about your um, relationship situation, your friendship situation? Well, I have some I see at work, but uh, I don't really like hanging out with people that much because uh, at least in this situation, we don't resonate with the same points. They don't like talking about this, 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 right? And what was he lacking? What was the thing that really made him jump on this coaching? He wanted to feel more and connect more. And I told him, hey, okay, step one, let's start feeling. And we did a release and he was able to feel at least a little bit in terms of some of the tragedies in his life. But even beyond that, in terms of socializing with people, I said, hey, at work, go and talk to anyone. And he's like, but some of them are not as smart and they won't be able to fuel my next goal. And I'm like, that's not the point. And he's like, well, why would I talk to them if there is no logical point, right? But the logical point isn't even the conversation. It's not the topic. There's not, it doesn't have to be an outcome all the time. The point is to connect with someone. That's the whole point of vibing, the whole point of socializing. You do it, why? Just for the experience, for experiencing someone else. And this is something that not many people talk about. Society takes it out of you. Um, even a lot of the advice when it comes to socializing doesn't say this. It's like, okay, well, you have trouble socializing. Instead of just connecting with someone, here's what you say. And then it becomes this very chess match game in terms of the different things you say or do. As opposed to, what about just talking for the sake of talking? And I'm sure you've had that experience where you just get lost in a conversation and time flies by. Does it matter what you talk about? No, what if it doesn't lead anywhere logically? It's fine, you're there just to connect with someone. We're social beings, we're here to connect with people in the world. And that was some of the first challenges I gave him. Talk to those people, see what it's like to feel. And it's fine if there's resistance at first. It's fine if your mind's like, well, this person's not even in a self-help. They don't grasp the nuanced concepts of letting go, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, that's fine. They only like talking about sports. That's fine. Vibe with everyone. Stop being so mental and judgmental, just filtering only that person because there's a goal. I talk to people who only talk about sports. Am I a big sports person? No. Do I know a lot about sports? No. Do I find sports the most fascinating topic? Of course not. But I love connecting with people. And that is something to dive into, okay? Get in the body, get out of the mind. There's more to life than this logical goal, outcome, everything must have some kind of plan and must lead to the next thing and that thing. Just do things for the sake of doing things. Here's another challenge you can give yourself. Go out with some of your friends to a restaurant or a bar. Don't drink. Just sit at a table. You can get like some water or soda water and just sit there with no purpose at all than just sitting there for three hours together and just see what happens. Because what we also realize doing this audit on our life is even when we're with friends, there's usually a certain purpose. It's like, okay, well, we're here to work on our social skills. We're here to do this work task. We're here to learn this, to talk about this. What about just sitting there and just staying there with no point to it? And it'll feel really weird at first, really awkward. But with time, you'll start getting a feel for, huh, just talking to talk. The purposeless talk in a beautiful way. What is life? The purposeless life. Logically, you can try to break it down as much as you want. Well, life is the evolution of this. At least it's like, okay, but in the end, what is it really? It's just an experience. Life is an experience. Everything you're doing, everything you're after, it's just an experience. Don't get so lost into trying to only find mental meaning. Find experiential meaning. Even in terms of different goals and outcomes that you're after. By all means, go for it. But why are you even going for that goal? For the experience of it. Live for experience. That's what I do. Oh, but I want to accomplish that goal. Great, I'm going to go for it but I'm gonna love every part of it. 
including the contrast. And this is something I personally remind myself of all the time. The ups and downs are what make the experience of life life. That's what makes it captivating and worth living. We all think logically, we want everything to go according to plan and be great. But if that were to happen, we would be in complete apathy. We wouldn't feel. That's what makes life pointless if everything just went according to plan. It was just flat, 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 flat. So embrace the ups and downs. Are some of the downs horrible? Of course. You know? But feel your way through it. Think of it as, huh, it's not my favorite. It's like eating the vegetables off, you know, as a kid. It's like, it's not my favorite, but it adds the contrast. And guess what? It is what it is. You have a choice. Is life always fair? Not necessarily. Does a lot of really messed up things happen in life? Of course. But as it is now, it's like, that's what it is. You can resist it and hate it and give up and withdraw. Or you can just roll with it and ride, roll with the punches. You have all eternity to be dead. Why not just roll the punches while you're here and open yourself up to whatever happens, whatever you experience while here? We all have, you could say, a habitual state where we reside in most of the time. For you two, for example, you're right here. Okay. And grief, again, you'll tend to, to oscillate a bit, but what we tend to do, and this is the big mistakes, I talked about this yesterday at the free tours, we aim too high. You know, you're here, or you might even be like, again, between the two, where it's like you're, you're feeling this grief, there's tends to go a bit of apathy, and then it's like, you don't want to experience anger, but you want to experience love. <laughs> you're like, and every time you kind of hit this, you go right back down, back down. So we aim too high, we fail, and oftentimes we just stay stuck. Now we will experience pockets of other states. So you might be in grief and you'll experience a little bit of purpose, a little bit of courage, a little bit of love, but then you just find your way back to what you know, okay? Now, biggest key, just aim for the next level up. Wherever you're at, aim for one up, then one up, then one up. For someone in apathy who's very cut off from feeling, or the, the general theme there is just withdrawn, it's kind of you've given up, okay? Um, in terms of feeling, it looks like you before we got to you. It looks like you yesterday, basically. You know, just very robotic, up in your head. Um, you have a little bit of that too, okay? Um, just kind of like withdrawing and that refusal to feel. When you're in this state, there's massive resistance to feeling some kind of grief all the time. You're in this state for a reason. There was something that was too much to handle at some point in time that you just closed yourself off to yourself. You can't get there until you go through what it is you're closed off to. In terms of apathy, what this also means is allowing yourself to do, or to do basically whatever you can to establish some hope. Because in this state, it feels like there is no hope. One thing that will give you hope that is counterintuitive and that the mainstream will promote is become a victim. If you're in apathy, being a victim is moving up. It's great advice, right? Like if you, for example, stop feeling like a victim and just start feeling like worse and worse, worse, you'd go down to apathy. Like, what's the point? I'll never find love. I'll never find a girl, et cetera, et cetera. And then like you move down. So from down here going up saying, hey, it's not your fault. It's, you know, it's that person's just like this kind of like, instead of like, what's the point? Whatever. It's, oh, poor me. I would, but this thing. And then the general theme is always feeling sorry for yourself. Whatever happens to you, whatever adversity is thrown to you, it always links to, I take responsibility a bit, poor little me, crying, so on and so forth. That's what you resort to as well. It's like put some confrontation instead of like boundary. There's that pull towards feeling sorry for yourself. People have that when they get rejected as well. It's like you go out, you say hi to someone rejected, and you're just crushed. It's like you play a video game and like you fail. Instead of being like, oh, it's like, okay, let's try again. Same event, but people at different levels, okay? Now, when you're in victimhood, this is when you're, you have to hear like that harsh talk where it's like, okay, for you, it's stop being a little bitch. For you, it's time to get fucking mad. Time to experience that anger you refused to experience back then. And to be clear here, it does also mean that sometimes back then, experiencing that anger was too much. It doesn't mean you had to experience back then. And this is very key. Um, you'll see people talk about this when it comes to trauma um, with animals. So for example, if there's a threat, the animal will go into like this, you know, fight or flight state. 
Is it time for the animal to experience like fear or feel sorry for itself? Fuck no, it's time to survive. For you at that point, if you might have experienced the anger, it's like you would have done stuff you might have regretted. It would, might have ruined your life. So it's time to survive. But the key is once you've survived, now it's time to experience it. But what we do is we just keep living in this survival. Okay. So in grief, it's take responsibility. Oh, but then that's scary. Good. Put yourself even in scary situations or get mad. Don't forgive. Think of all those people who screwed you over. Doesn't that make you mad? Don't you want to do something about it? Don't you want to prove them wrong? That's what you got to tap into. Once you're in anger, however, now you got to start forgiving. If you say forgive them here, oh, it's just more poor me. But here, moving up, crying is good. Here, it just kind of fuels it. Here, it's time to forgive. Okay. Courage is when you finally start taking some action and you're just kind of fumbling around. There tends to be a lot of procrastination, focusing on the wrong things, putting things off so on and so forth. It's kind of, it's more of a neutral state. Desire is like your ego kicks in. It's like, oh, I can do this. What are people going to think? So on and so forth. Um, this is the person who tends to be a little bit more try hard. Um, always trying to like one up others, always trying to look cool, so on and so forth. Purpose is when you let go of this and you discover, okay, instead of just doing things always for approval for others, I kind of discover that innate drive. What do I actually feel inspired to do? And then love is more of the state of acceptance, abundance, so on and so forth, okay? But this tends to be the model. All of you can find one area you reside in the most, and then you all have different pockets. This is Julian, and if you're someone who has social anxiety, you fear putting yourself out there, or you procrastinate, you put things off, you come up with excuses, or you're lost, and you have no purpose in life, then pay very close attention, because this scale of transformation is what has helped me change the lives of thousands of people around the world. Now, I wanna help you identify exactly where you're at, and give you customized feedback and action steps to get you moving up fast. Don't be one of the people who just dabbles around in the dark trying to figure it out on their own. Jump on a free call with myself or an expert from my team and let us help you. Just click the link below this video. Tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll be reaching out very soon. Click the link right now and let's do this.